with a green and digital transition, enabling energy consumers as agents and beneficiaries. My name is Dave Keating. I'm a journalist based here in Brussels. Welcome to everyone here in the room and also to those of you joining us online. Now, we know that this is an intense time for European consumers who are facing both a cost of living crisis and an energy crisis. And in that context, engaging consumers for a successful transition towards a carbon neutral, digitized and just energy system has become ever more pressing. Now, it looks like we've passed the peak of these crises, though worse could still be yet to come. So what lessons have we learned by what lessons have been learned by energy regulators, by consumer organizations, by energy companies and other stakeholders? And what features of our current market and policy design still need better adaptation to suit customers' needs? How were these measures implemented and how can they be fine-tuned in periods where maybe we're in less of a panic? These are the questions we're gonna be grappling with today at the 2023 customer conference. What were the successful strategies and what were the less successful aspects of awareness raising campaigns in particular? And where is there space for improvement? How must energy markets be tweaked for stronger crisis resilience? And what tools are consumers lacking? Which barriers are consumers still facing for sustainable and affordable consumption? To answer these questions, we have an extraordinary lineup of speakers and panelists joining us here in the room and online. And you in the audience will be able to participate in the discussion as well. If you're here in the room, you'll be able to raise your hand and I'll call on you in the room. If you're watching online, you'll see you have a little Q&A button. It's got a question mark on it. You can put your questions to the panelists there and then I can read them out. Um, for those of you joining online, please make sure that you're muted for the entire event as questions will only be posed in writing and that Q&A button uh, for the people participating online. So today we're going to have two sessions of three panels each. We've had one last minute speaker change in our last panel on information and skills for green consumption. Ludovic Voe is unfortunately not able to, to attend. However, we will have Marco Salento, also from the European Trade Union Confederation to replace him. Uh, now, to get us started, I would like to introduce CEER President Annegret Grobel. Due to a train strike in Germany, she wasn't able to join us here in person, but we're lucky that she can still join us here online. So, Annegret, I turn the floor over to you. Yes, many thanks, Mr. Keating, uh, for taking over as moderator. And I'm very glad to welcome uh, all the many speakers that uh, we that we have and of course all the many participants i see already more than 70 uh, connected online i can't count the ones that are in the room where i would also like to would have liked to be uh, but as you said uh, i was uh, grounded so to speak uh, here in bonn uh, but luckily we have the possibility uh, to give a few sp uh, opening remarks uh, why, um, uh, remotely. So uh, welcome again to everyone, and thank you uh, for Mr. Keating to uh, to be the moderator of our uh, CR customer conference, uh, which we are glad to have uh, in this hybrid uh, mode, uh, and indeed uh, with a very um, hot uh, topic, so to speak, the the twin transition, as it is all also called, and here in a specific sense also let's say getting back maybe a little bit uh, to to normal uh, and linking uh, the experiences that we have learned uh, from the crisis uh, to the uh, to the main challenge that we all have to face in this sector and in the broader economy and that is uh, getting uh, the uh, transformation uh, towards a, a green and resilient uh, energy system and economy as a whole uh, uh, back on track, so to speak, and as we also say in our CR strategy, uh, to put the consumer, the customer in the center of this transition so that the, um, that the consumer is at the same uh, time uh, the, the, the profiter and also the decision maker and not just, uh, let's say, in, as in former times, uh, the, um, the rate payer, so, but has an active role to play. 
And of course, uh, we have now, as I said, to get back on track a little bit. And certainly it is not easy now to, uh, to address the customer and to see uh, that the customer uh, will be uh, back in the in this transition uh, in this transition process, and I think what can be helpful so in a longer term process. Uh, and I think what can be helpful in this, uh, and there is where the sec where the lessons learned come in. Uh, how did we manage the crisis? How were was the uh, customer addressed? Uh, you mentioned already the campaign, the the awareness raising campaign, and what can we maybe uh, retain uh, from this uh, more speedy uh, decision taking, more speedy decision making, uh, and um, let's say supporting in in a sense the consumer in a sense that he will be able to do the necessary decisions and play an active part in the energy transition uh, by himself so it's less passive and more uh, more open but at the same time also where that uh, the regulators are there uh, to uh, protect uh, the consumer and to empower the consumer. I think we have to see always these two elements together, protecting the consumer to become more, and empowering the consumer to become more active and to benefit from the energy transition, from uh, both uh, transitions, so the digital transition, uh, facilitating indeed for the consumer the participation, uh, making, cho making the choices uh, to switch, for example, uh, and uh, to use uh, the flexibility in a, in a, in a more uh, active way and also then uh, bring uh, benefit uh, to the grid, uh, to stability to the grid and to the energy system as a whole, so that we get back uh, in, a, in a way to this longer term perspective, a way from the short term activism that we had to overcome the crisis. And of course, at this time, this was, uh, this was clear that this was, had to be the focus. But I think now we should leave the crisis models, uh, mode behind us uh, and uh, see, uh, have a forward-looking approach going more into the future, based, as I said, on decisions that were also and and the way we reacted in the crisis uh, for the for the benefit of longer-term uh, longer-term active uh, participation in the market and a flexible approach using the flexibility and using the possibilities that consumers will have when the system becomes overall more digitalized. And of course, as I said, there are also challenges uh, and we need to, uh, to, to educate consumers to be able to make use in an informed way and in an, make an informed choice uh, to, uh, of, uh, uh, towards uh, these uh, possibilities. Uh, and thereby, as I said, contributing to the energy transition and to the transition of the system, making it more flexible, but at the same time also uh, benefiting uh, from this step uh, of uh, making, uh, um, contributing to the system and being more more active in a, in a system. And I think in, in this uh, more flexible energy system more, uh, that we that will be typical for the future. So I think that is the, the important aspect that we have to, uh, to take into uh, account. And I think we are now, uh, and we have also with us uh, some some MEPs, uh, so we know that uh, there, there, there is also uh, questions of what needs to be changed or fine-tuned uh, in the electricity market design. At the same time, the uh, gas decarbonization package is, is on track now to be finalized very soon. The trilogue already uh, is, uh, is starting, is ongoing. And so we again can see here what experiences are beneficial and where do we need uh, to fine tune the current system uh, to get, uh, as I said, a well functioning market, well functioning retail market, uh, getting also ensuring that uh, if there are price reductions on the wholesale level, that these are passed through uh, to the customers. And this, I think, we as regulators have to make sure that markets are well functioning and that uh, the uh, renewables uh, are 
uh, getting uh, into the grid and into the market uh, in a way that is uh, beneficial for all market participants. Uh, and last but not least, uh, the, the consumers. I think there were, there were probably a snow in taking up this possibility, but I think now there is a momentum uh, that they will uh, be able uh, to be uh, more active. So that is what we also SCR are doing on, uh, with our um, customer and retail market working group. And I have seen already uh, Natalie McCoy and uh, for sure also Jana Hasova is there, our two uh, co-chairs of this important group, uh, looking at all the uh, different aspects, customer-related, consumer-related uh, aspects. And I'm very happy that uh, we have uh, put on uh, uh, this uh, very, very interesting program and the a uh, lot of the speakers. And uh, with this, I would like uh, to uh, introduce now Mr. Nicolas gonzalez Cazares, uh, the rapporteur for the EMD. So thanks for making time available, even so we all know how much you are putting together the report. So many thanks for this. And uh, over to you uh, for the keynote speech. Thanks a lot. And uh, I wish us all a very good conference. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I apologize for not being Brussels, but we have local elections now in Spain. And you know, I am politician, so I have to work also into my constituency. We we have presented the the <coughs> energy electricity market design, but we have to work everywhere. I don't know you. Uh, ah, okay, you are listening to me. Okay, perfect. Perfect. I can hear you and I can assure you I know how difficult it is to, to get uh, um, to Brussels. Uh, I'm also not in Brussels myself. <laughs> okay. So first I want to thank you to the Council of European Energy Regulators for the invitations and congratulations on the event that you have organized today. Also thank you to all participants. I think that energy systems are in the middle of the deep uh, transformation, not only of, uh, we are working only on tackle climate change, but also because it makes economic sense. It will likewise make the system more resilient in the face of crisis like the current one. Both objectives will make it possible to optimize this transition from an economical and technical point of view through the sectoral integration of the different energy careers and, systems and sectors. All these needs an adaptation of the energy markets and the infrastructure to a more complex and integrated energy system where suppliers and consumers can actively interact with the energy system. I think that in this sense, uh, the digitalization of energy service is essential to unlocking the untapped potential. For example, on the demand side response, which I will refer later. We have the technology to solve the energy trilemma. It is not a technical problem. This is a problem of will, economics, and justice, and also a problem of equity. In addition to the threat of climate change, we could see since middle of 2021, how our dependence on fossil fuels is being turned against us and it is used as a geopolitical weapon. Uh, Russia and the unjustified military aggression against Ukraine has upended energy markets, triggering price volatility and energy insecurity worldwide. So now we are in a time of changes, in a time of boosting decarbonization, and also in a time of reforms to make the energy and the electricity affordable to our citizens. Because this crisis is also that show us that we have to engage citizens in the energy transition. We work at, in the Renewable Energy Directive, for example, as you know, last March, Council and Parliament reached the provisional deal on the Renewable Energy Directive. Um, I think that first we have to mention that renewable sources 
are not subject to the same dependency of third countries and our industrial and environmental opportunity for Europe. So I think that the acceleration of renewables and increasing the target of renewable to a final gross of a gross final renewable energy consuming in 2030 to 42.5 means that we are in the right track. This means that by 2030, around the 70% of the European electricity should come from renewable sources. This increase has an impact on the electricity market. So therefore, this must be updated. In this sense, I believe that the Commission is right to reform both the support schemes and the flexibility measures. I want to refer now to the reform of the electricity market. I think that we can cost effectively the carbonized sectors as transport, industry, and buildings through electrification based on renewable energy and promote other energy careers such as green hydrogen. I think that for electrification to be successful, electricity must be competitive. However, the wholesale market prices seen last summer are putting in danger the promotion of the necessary electrification. It's clear that the record prices have affected the support of electrification. We must avoid this and work for a future-proof market design to solve the by the default situations and accelerate renewable energy deployment, improve our competitiveness as well. Now we have the opportunity that we must take to establish a future-proof design. And me as a reporter on the electricity market design, last Friday, I sent my draft report and let me explain some of the principal points. Regarding CFZ to help to decouple the gas from electricity, I support the proposal of the Commission of promoting two weights contracts for difference to provide consumers with a stable prices and producers with certainty. However, some adjustments are needed. In the distribution of revenues obtained from CSD, Priority should be given to those consumers who, who need it most. Moreover, it should be oriented towards energy efficiency measures that contribute to energy savings. And also, generation under CFDs should continue to adjust its output to reflect market circumstances. PPAs is other way to private financing of renewable generation capacity while providing long-term stability to consumers. Thin PPAs are a good tool. However, this market is currently limited to large company and vertically integrated energy companies. I propose more transparency to a European database and a standardization of PPAs for voluntary use and, in addition, creation of a platform for PPA trading. The idea behind these proposals is to facilitate the entry of small players and lowering transaction costs. When it comes to storage and flexibility, to protect ourselves from the price volatility fossil fuels, I think that we need an efficient integration of renewables into the electricity system. So. We must have measures that provide flexibility to the grid, to the activation of the demand side, the management of this demand, and also support storage. I support the Commission approach, but I also want to, pro to propose to work in a European minimum level of storage and demand response, consistent with the 2030 energy and climate targets. I also want to mention that we need to protect consumers. This is a fundamental objective of this reform. For me, reinforce the rights and guarantees of consumers, especially the most vulnerable ones and those in a situation of energy poverty. Among other measures, 
I propose to introduce the obligation for member states to prevent the discrimination of vulnerable consumers. Let me be clear and honest. I belong to the socialist group. I am a social democrat. I believe in social justice. So for me, it's very important to maintain these protections for consumers. And of course, we have, or we need uh, uh, tools to tackle uh, another possible price crisis. I think that the previous crisis has shown that uh, the protection and stabilization measures of the current market design are not enough and fossil fuels are playing a tricky game in the electricity market. So we should protect ourselves. I think that it is positive that the Commission introduce specific measures for periods of crisis. However, the proposal from the Commission does not resolve how to finance them, which means leaving countries with less fiscal space and therefore their citizens at a disadvantage. Therefore, another pillar, important pillar of my proposal is to reinforce the tools proposed by the Commission to tackle the next electricity price crisis. I think it's necessary to correct this gap by incorporating as a structural instrument of the system, a measure that you can introduce during a crisis, such as the temporary, temporary, to be clear, temporary cap of the market revenues of inframarginal generators. So that part of them can be used to alleviate a new price shock. Such measures should be introduced on a structural basis at a European level to provide a source of funding for these regulated tariffs because it provides predictability to consumers and investors by knowing the rules in advance and avoid fragmentation of the internal market through the introduction of common rules that fit for all members or 27 member states. So I think that we are in a track, very important reform, we have discussion ahead in the Parliament, also in the Council, but to conclude, let me say that citizens must be able to take advantage of the benefits of electricity with a low OPEX, as occurs with renewables. The reform of the electricity market design is a need, an urgent need, and I think that for me, this is an opportunity to carry out social reform of the electricity market in balance with the need to ensure the necessary investments in renewable technologies, the energy transition with everyone on board. Thank you too much. Thanks very much, uh, both to Anugret Grobel and uh, Mr. Gonzalez for those opening remarks. I think that really hits home how important all of this is to all EU citizens out there because all EU citizens are energy consumers in one way or another. So let's start with session one, where we're going to be talking about customer engagement, lessons from the energy crisis in a digital era. So in these three panels during this session, we're going to be really honing in on how you engage customers and how they can save money, save energy, and help themselves with the high cost of energy that we're facing. So let me introduce you to the panelists for the first panel, which will be dedicated to consumer uh, protection and uh, demand reduction during the energy crisis. We have Monique Goyens, Director General of the European Consumer Organization, Bayuk, and we have Maureen Cornelis, Founder and Executive Director at Next Energy Consumer. Thanks both for joining us. Monique, let's start with you. What would you say that governments, regulators, and industry should be doing to protect consumers during crises like the one that we're experiencing at the moment? What actions should be taken? Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dave, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, I'm happy that you uh, said should be doing, not have been doing, because uh, there might be a difference. Um, the I mean, I would like to provide three types of messages in the, those few minutes. Uh, first of all, what member states should do and should have done uh, last year is uh, protect consumers during the crisis, but with a focus on the more vulnerable consumers. And what we have seen 
during this crisis, or let's say at least last year's crisis, is that there has been no positive discrimination. Uh, everybody has been helped, also those who didn't need it. That means that there has been a lot of waste of money. Because, can I say, you and I didn't really need the support that we got. And that support has been redirected from those who need it most and who have not had enough support to those who don't need it. This can be understandable from the, uh, the government perspective because they wanted to, sh to be perceived as helping. Uh, and they wanted to be acting very quickly, but they have not delivered to those who needed it most. So this is something that in any future uh, action, there should be much more fine-tuned support for, uh, directed towards those who really need uh, that support. The support should also be smart. And there again, um, you know, um, there has been money paid out to people um, and again, to those people who are living in the less renovated homes, uh, in the less in, um, insulated homes, so you give them 500 euro and it's being spent, they still are cold because the house is not insulated. And they could have spent, it could have been directed to them in a way that would be also having a long-term impact, like helping them insulate, renovate, and not a deep retrofitting, because that would be a long-term, uh, but you can, with very low-hanging food, with a few hundred or a few thousand euro, you can insulate the house in a way that already makes a big difference in terms of not only energy bill, but also comfort of the house. So um, we would uh, really advocate for, um, let's say, a more fine-tuned approach when uh, such crises arrive, and also, by the way, outside of those crises, if you want to help people to get into energy efficiency. From the, cons uh, from the supplier side, what I would like to say, because the government governments are only part of the actors, um, there uh, we, um, we, we called really for an important, um, let's say, change of attitude of, uh, on the supplier side in terms of flexibility. So if there are late payments, please be flexible. Try, don't disconnect people uh, too quickly. And there um, we have to acknowledge, and we would like to acknowledge that uh, suppliers certainly after the joint declaration that has been signed uh, with the support of the European Commission, but also by uh, the energy regulators, by several uh, companies and, and uh, associations and the consumer organizations, there has been much more flexibility. And in practice, there have not been a lot of disconnections. Uh, the problem being that consumers were not aware of it. And so there have been some sort of self-refrain or self-disconnection just because people were aware of being disconnected, uh, were afraid of being disconnected. So very important to also reach out uh, to consumers to tell them, be reassured, we are there to help you. And there, are, there have been in, in Europe quite some few best practices by some companies who have done that. So that's really something we would like to um, comment. The second point that we have observed is what a moment of stress for all of us. I mean, who knew that they had a fixed price contract or a, a, a tariff, uh, uh, you know, variable? When is the end of my contract? What is the, what, how much do I pay for, a, for a, a kilowatt hour? And even I had uh, difficulties in finding that. And when I asked the provider, you know what they told me? My company, they said, we cannot provide you this information, go to the regulator. And they are the ones making my invoice. Can you imagine? So anyway, uh, this is just that was a moment of stress at that time. And there we really believe that there must be a very clear information that is available for consumers, accurate, trustworthy, understandable about what energy offer is the best for them. At the moment of the energy crisis, there was a huge demand for fixed price contract. And what happened there is that many people have been locked in high price contracts while well, now prices are going down. Uh, and in many countries, dynamic contracts, dynamic price contracts are the ones that are best for consumers. But do consumers know that? It's not very much advertised for the moment. So uh, it is very important there. And there the new, the new proposal, uh, the new commission proposal on uh, elect, uh, electricity market design provides some improvements. But it's really important to um, provide the tools to consumers to shift uh, um, to more flexible contracts or to those energy offers that uh, are best for them. And the third and last point I would like to make, if you allow, uh, Dave, um, and it's more general, um, it's the fact that um, we always say that, uh, of course, here we have a crisis situation, but the best way is to reduce energy consumption. This is something I have been saying for like 20 years or so. Uh, I'm a little bit like a broken record. But what is very important to know is that it's even be uh, in spite or because it, we have a cost of living crisis, you should even prioritize 
because any energy efficiency investment that you make will save you money for years and years. And uh, what I also wanted to say is that uh, everybody wants to uh, reduce the energy bill. That's good. But also, this is very much needed for the, energy, for the, uh, the, the Green Deal, for the, the climate crisis that needs to be addressed. And can I say the energy transition will not, not happen only with the elite. It will need to be happen with the critical mass of people uh, investing into energy efficiency, meaning that you have to bring energy efficiency also those who don't have the, the money or the, the possibilities to do it with their own upfront investment, uh, investment tools. So if you really want this to happen, both a massive in, uh, decrease in your energy bills and a massive de decrease in energy consumption on a collective level, you need to make it easy and affordable uh, for the people. And when I say easy, it can also be fun. We all, very often, and I think some people in the room know more about that than me, gamification, make it catchy. The most downloaded app in Estonia during the energy crisis was, was the app that provided hourly updates on the energy prices. So it was not uh, any f funny game. Um, there was also, um, what we also need is people being supported. It's not just about catchy uh, websites. You need what we call one-stop shops. People need to be supported in the whole journey about what is best for me in terms of, for example, heating solution or cooling solution or lighting solution uh, or uh, home renovation. So it must be uh, initial advice, uh, identification of what's best for you, identification of who is best for you in terms of installer and finding together uh, with you the um, the funding, the finance solution. You can have incentives, you can have subsidies, you can also have creative, but we're still waiting that for that. Where, where are the financial institutions in that uh, story? Because you need really creative uh, financing models. Uh, um, and we need uh, also um, uh, to have the support from the private sector. Last point, in my own garden, uh, consumer organizations have also a role to play to make this energy efficiency affordable and easily available for consumers. And for example, and I have some members in the room who do that, uh, we organize collective purchase campaigns in order to have like this uh, critical mass of uh, purchase power in order to bring prices down for heavier investments, be it boilers or be it heat pumps. This is uh, just to start. <laughs> Thanks, Monique. Um, I am one of those people who did not know whether he had a fixed or variable rate at the start of the crisis and was delighted to find I had just signed a fixed rate contract just before the crisis for three years, but through no effort of my own. And I was kind of embarrassed because I report on this stuff. And I realized that when I signed that contract, I just did whatever they suggested. I got lucky, but I'm sure other people did not. Um, let's go on to uh, Maureen. So speaking of you know, people who didn't get lucky with contracts, I mean, one, one thing that this really brings out, <laughs> the, the less fortunate, um, but you know, uh, on a serious note, thinking of people who are less fortunate with energy, that leads to the question of energy poverty. Um, so what are the most pressing global challenges when it comes to energy poverty, and how is this current energy crisis exasperating those? Um, for the record, I must say that uh, I have been exactly in the same situation as you, except that I took a step forward uh, before and I changed and switched to a fixed contract, except that my, uh, my supplier collapsed. And I knew that only six months after. Uh, so in the meantime, I was paying incredible bills uh, to the supplier of last resort. But it exists, so that's a good thing. Um, Italy. Um, so what, what, uh, what we noticed is that we are really living an uh, interesting time. We are, living, uh, we are witnessing a paradigm shift somehow in Europe, but also in the rest of the world, with two apparently very... Uh, contradictory forces at stake are on the one hand it's absolutely no longer acceptable not to have access to modern energy uh, to have uh, your energy cut off for non-payment um, but this obviously doesn't happen in a vacuum and uh, on the other hand climate change and agri crisis and more and more extreme weather events such as heat waves uh, or drought made the possibility of general blackouts um, that are already very very frequent in many places very much more likely in Europe as well so I would say that it's the time for policymakers and regulators to roll up their sleeves we are here in this room, which is overheated, uh, to build uh, new ecosystems that actually guarantee a right to energy uh, while balancing social and um, environmental emergencies. 
So as we all know, since 2021, uh, consumers have been constrained to change their, their habits and reduce their energy consumption. And I think we can really applaud this collective effort. But many people throughout Europe had to sacrifice their comfort. So yesterday, when I got, well, actually, when I got here, I read this article from The Economist. I recommend uh, uh, that everybody reads it uh, because he, it says that uh, in high energy prices last winter had claimed Europe 68,000 uh, excess deaths, which was more than uh, the official number for COVID. And this should never, ever happen again, of course. This is like the extreme uh, situation of energy poverty, but who, how many people ended up in the hospital for that reason? We, we don't know, we don't have the data. We can read many, many testimonies on local newspaper, but aggregated data on energy poverty are with the figure from 2020. So we are already two years late. How can we intervene on that? How can we make a difference? How can we know how it has evolved. Uh, we, we need way more granular information about energy poverty. And we need to understand whether certain categories, such as middle class people, low middle class people, have fallen into this as well. So at the time being, we don't know if we are closer to 35 or 100 million people affected by energy poverty, and we still lack data on solar energy poverty. It should be collected this year. Um, and worldwide, uh, we also need to think that about 700 million people lack access to modern electricity and modern energy in general. It's the whole population of the US and Europe taken to together. And we are talking about young people, very young people, young generation. So how do you want to build that in opportunities for 2050, an energy transition that goes into, uh, that looks into the future as well? So let's say that in Europe we were quite lucky because until a couple of years ago the right to energy was some kind of guaranteed by the illusion of the, the security of supply. But now high price and sacrifices, we have to acknowledge that they kill and they do also compromise this universal access to, to energy and this is totally unfair. Um, you know, besides, you know, the if for those who know me, I love complaints. I love looking at complaints. And the complaints about disconnection and bad commercial practices, they have soared. Uh, people are extremely concerned. And many, many, many uh, states and regions have decided to ban disconnections uh, for non-payment, which seems very reasonable uh, given the context. But wouldn't it be quite also quite a good practice to bring to COP, to bring to international uh, uh, platforms to say we want a proper right to energy, a uh, right to energy as there is a right to water uh, international, in international treaties. Let's also include one in the directive, something, let's say, uh, let, uh, let's prohibit extermination, let's have a, a right to energy because the right to energy is the right to have a decent life. Besides, uh, we need to acknowledge that we are facing, uh, it's our resilience as a continent that is at stake, uh, meaning that the global warming is, um, will shift uh, peak consumption towards uh, the summer. And on this side, we have a lot to learn from the southern part of the world and uh, in particular Africa. Um, so what happens in this situation? It is supposed that people need to change a lot the way they consume, they need to change their habits, and at the regulatory level, at the technical level, it means network balancing and different tools, such as digital tools, to make that happen. Uh, we have to learn that we need to use electricity when it's available in abundance, but also kind of re restrict ourselves uh, at the risk of general blackouts. <laughs> But to counter this, we really need to accept new tools, and dynamic tariffs are an example. Uh, digital tools, uh, some digital tools can aggregate data, monitor remotely, carry out micro-interventions to avoid general blackouts. Uh, but top-down processes, they hardly reach any consensus. Uh, they hardly empower people, and they make everything more difficult. So the social acceptance part, we all know that, is, it's extremely delicate. Let me tell you an example. I've noticed recently in a flexibility project I'm working on in Africa, that households don't want uh, these kind of interventions, the, the, the micro flexibility uh, happen. Like they don't want to be, be, their household to be controlled. They want to be monitored, but they don't want to be controlled. The nuance is fundamental. And what makes the difference in, in having one of those devices or not is 
explain to them what's going on and that it's not invasive, that their, their data is safe, nobody will steal their pattern, nobody will, will, will shift the loads or, or whatever when they are, not, they are not interested. So it's really delicate. We have to, to see that they are we are facing, when talking about digitalization, uh, not in my pantry. We're not, not even talking about not in my backyard. We're not talking about not in my pantry. Uh, it's in people's home. And uh, it, is, it becomes particularly true if we have bad experience with smart devices, like a smart meter that doesn't deliver on its promise to give accurate and timely bills. It's extremely important to have this. So overall, we need to ask, what are the guarantees for everyday people? It's always going back to everyday people. And how are, those, are the international stakeholders liable? Because we are navigating quite a gray zone between digital and telecommunication and energy regulations. The providers of digital tools, of smart tools, etc., for instance, they are increasingly global. They are increasingly more integrated and more complex to understand. And this has consequences on the way those services work, uh, their readability, their reliability as well. And for instance, their design does not always uh, include the most vulnerable, or they can even not be adapted to human needs. Uh, I would recommend you to, to look into what's happening in Songdu, Korea. It's, it was a smart city, but nobody wants to live there because it's too smart for robots maybe, but not for human beings. So indeed, I would say that demands like flexibility and voluntarily reducing consumption with digital tools, etc., they are critical. Then they are even indispensable tools in this kind of survival mode that we're, we have entered into. And that guarantees a high quality uh, energy supply for all is really critical. And it's the only way to create, to maintain our living models, make sure that we have a, a social economic growth as well, and keep our lives really livable. And overall, it also means it, it it means, uh, in a nutshell, that we need to learn how to do better with less, and it's the principle of energy sufficiency. So, specifically, and this is really my last point, uh, if we use an energy or climate justice lens, um, a global lens, really, on, this, uh, on those questions, is we need to ask ourselves, who's going to be vulnerable? Who's going to benefit? Digitalization tools and overall the energy transition must be instruments to level the playing field and not create further gaps and create inequalities. And so it shouldn't work only for rich people, uh, those who are already wealthy, who can pay the supply of last resort, but for really everybody. Uh, we may sh must make sure that all the benefits trickle down to everyone. So to, for the transition to be a just transition, we must always keep the people with all their complexity at the center, focusing on improving the quality of life, maintaining comfort. In Europe, we are old. We need to maintain our comfort. Uh, and uh, in the global world, we need within energy to, to just move forward. So it supposes to co-construct solutions with the people, with civil society organizations, just like Berg, with ombudsmen, with researchers, with all different parties. And, you know, I really believe in the regulator's role to create the foundation of trust to, so that every party can serve society and deliver for the people. They must facilitate access to information to avoid misinformation and delay in action. People want to be treated as equal. And after all, let's remember that energy consumers don't exist. They don't exist only citizens with rights. Thanks, Maureen. Before we go on to the next panel, I want to put a quick question to uh, Monique. I'll put this to you that's come in from online. It's about lifestyle changes. So the question is from Lorraine. Um, what do sustainable consumption patterns mean in practice? How do you apply them in your everyday life? And do you have any advice on how to make our habits more sustainable? Well. First of all, something I very often say, I, speak, uh, I work a lot on different aspects of the green transition, the green deal. And uh, I always say you can uh, roll out as many smart policies as you want. It will be the people who will make it happen. So we all need to change our lifestyles. I said to a colleague when walking to the Borchette here, yes, we all need to eat less meat. Uh, he might recognize himself. In the <laughs> Uh, but we also need to change the way we heat our homes, the way we, uh, we buy clothes, the way we, tra we travel, the way we don't travel, the way we, uh, travel, uh, we move in, in, in cities. So, um, so I think really there is a lot of lifestyle changes that everybody can contribute to. So, I mean, 
we can eat less meat, we don't need to become all ve vegans, we can just uh, reduce your meat consumption, you're part of the solution. Uh, take the train rather than taking the plane, you're part of the solution, or at least less, you cannot uh, necessarily uh, take uh, the train to everywhere. But so, I have, uh, I'm a tenant and I have convinced my landlord to install solar panels. It was a negotiation, but I managed to do it. And so now I have an electric car that doesn't cost me anything because I have solar panels in my, in my, in my house. So this is, I try to, this is the type of things, of course, I'm part of the wealthy consumers or the wealthier in this. So, but uh, this is how you can contribute. Of course, I always try to buy electric appliances that are the best rated in the, in the energy label. So this is the way we do it. And I mean, you can, there are so many solutions that exist. And if all of us only apply 20% of those solutions, we are already a huge part of the, the progress. It, it is, you shouldn't make it more complicated than it is. Thanks. Well, we'll have more time for questions at the end of the session for all of the panelists. But for now, let's move on to the second panel, which is on the potential of digitalization and self-consumption for shielding consumers. And for this panel, we have here to my left, Justin Pad Padgen, who is a representative of AGEM, the Dutch energy community. And we have to my right, Natalie McCoy, co-chair of the Customers and Retail Markets Working Group at CEER. Um, Justin, let me start with a question for you. What advantages do new energy consumption models have over traditional energy market models? What are the specific deliverables there? So, do this, right? This is new for me. Um, so, maybe I can explain. I brought some slides. So, it's good maybe to look at the traditional model first, right? Is there a slide, the next slide? So, this picture is what I call the traditional market model, right? And so let's start on the production side, where if you have a production installation, you want to sell this energy for the highest price, right? That will bring you the highest revenue, which is the highest return on investment, which was probably the idea in the first place. So to do this, you um, uh, contract a PPA with a supplier who will basically give you market price. And in the Netherlands, this will always be uh, the day ahead market, the spot market. So if we look at the consumption side, we want to consume energy. We obviously want to do this at the lowest possible price. So we go to our supplier and he has a contract for us. And basically what they offer is market price. So you'll see here in the traditional market model that the, uh, the production on side and the consumption side have opposing interests, which they basically, uh, the one wants the lowest price and the other one wants the highest price and they end up paying the market price, which is fine, I guess, if this would lead to a fair price. But as we have seen in the, uh, in the, in the last period, this is obviously not the case. So to change this, we would like to um, uh, go to the next slide and actually um, present a different type of model. So let's start this time on the consumption side and produce the amount of electricity that we actually need. And not because we want to have a return on investment, but we, because we want to consume this energy. And so a collective of consumers becomes a co-owner of production installation. And obviously, if they are the owner of a windmill and a solar panel, they want to consume this energy directly which is, if you actually have a good balanced production portfolio, possible for about 70% of the volume. Now, what would you pay for this electricity? That would obviously be the cost price, right? And the cost price is about 50, 60, 70 euros per megawatt hour. And for the period of maybe 15, 20 years, this will be very constant. Now, and this is obviously also for the ones that know what the energy prices are, way, way lower than the peak in the energy crisis and also much lower than now, actually. So, admittedly, not 100% of the produced electricity can be consumed at the same time. About 30% will be a surplus or a shortage, will, which the energy community will have to sell on the market or buy on the market. Now, obviously, you will sell for a low price and buy for a high, high price. So this will increase the cost price, which will also create an incentive for the energy community to 
um, actually consume when the electricity is available. Now, to do this, the energy community needs an energy service provider, which I kind of um, uh, show at the top there um, uh, with the yellow dotted line. And this energy service provider basically needs, needs a lot of software and administration, right? So we need to do forecasting. We need software for our balanced responsibility role. We need software to have market access. And we need software to do customer care and billing. And when we do these things, we can basically play this role. So the good news is we at Aachen, we can actually do this for an energy community. We have done this now for municipalities, and we started a first pilot for a consumer-based um, energy community. But we still need to scale this up, and there's still a lot of challenges ahead. The first main thing is we need to change this opposing interest between producer and consumer. If we do that, we do that by ownership. So we also need to rethink ownership. Ownership now is basically based on your capacity to invest, right? But it should maybe be, if we want it to be inclusive, your capacity or your willingness to commit to this model. Because this is not a model that really works for shopping every year for your best price. No, this is a commitment for the long term for a fair price. And it will shield consumers for about 70%, maybe even more, from very volatile market prices. Great, thanks a lot. So that's a good big picture. Uh, I think it's all on. Uh, it's a good big picture overview of the different types of models for energy markets. Let's drill down to how that affects the consumers. Um, so, Natalie, when we're talking about digitalization and and these kinds of new possibilities, can you tell us a little bit about the what the benefits are for consumers and also the potential for energy savings? Thank, thank you very much. Uh, we've already heard quite a, a lot of good advice and, and, and good ideas um, from the previous speakers. So, um, how to bring this more into the practical sphere? And I think uh, Justin already started uh, with a very good example. But um, I guess this particular panel does capture. You know, we're talking about the twin transition. You know, digital and green, and and self-consumption as a as a overall, whether it's self or collective, is very much the. the if you will, the union of the two concepts. So you need the technology to deliver some of these some of these um, services and, and solutions. And um, yeah, I couldn't agree more with we heard from from uh, Nicolas um, Gonzalez. That indeed, we have to get all of us to engage uh, actively, and the relationship, a mutual co complementarity between the suppliers, the producers, and and the citizens or consumers that we all are. Uh, and that, of course, it's not necessarily a technology problem. There are all kinds of innovations and technology solutions and, and management programs and services that can ha help to make this all happen. And indeed, it is a compromise between the level of sophistication of an energy community where you need all of these different um, back office things to be happening and uh, a fit and forget where we can just do it ourselves. We have some solar panels on our <laughs> landlord's roof. And there you go, we have electricity in our house and, and we can avoid the volatile energy market, which is part of the shielding, um, I guess, objective um, that we've re really become very focused on, thanks to or because of uh, the, the crisis. So for, for us, it's, um, it's how to bring these two things together, but it's not all about the benefits. There, you know, there's always pluses and minuses, and there are benefits and, and risks and challenges. And I, I think I'd like to be balanced in that sense, as, as good regulators have to be <laughs> in, in our proposals. And so last year, we did some work on um, digitalization and illustrating just exactly the kind of potential that these, if you will, possibilities, technology possibilities can, can give consumers and to deliver out real outcomes for, for all of us. And, and not just for individuals, but also for the energy system as a whole. So in December, we published this report. Um, we tried to look at the issue from six different angles. And, and it's going to sound, I mean, this is a little parentheses publicity, 
uh, for CER. We have um, our 2030 vision, which we've done in cooperation with Beog on uh, energy consumers. And uh, within it, we've defined six key principles. And you may have heard of these already because we talk about it every time we get an opportunity. The Aspire principle. So affordability, simplicity, protection, uh, inclusiveness, reliability, and empowerment. And in fact, if you look at these principles, the fancy words, they say, say a lot and they say nothing. But actually, they, they illustrate very clearly just the terms the benefits and the risks, you know, th there's a, two sides to every coin. So inclusiveness has the pros and, you know, and the challenges of how you actually deliver that. And that's something that even Marine was mentioning earlier. So looking at these six different angles, we, we really try to identify in this paper some of the different um, benefits and the how-tos, what can be done about it, but also the challenges of actually making it work in practice. So yes, digitalization, it's an enabler, it's a driver. Um, it's good for individual or energy community collective consumption and it the potential what benefits are there this was your question um, it took me a while to get to it but um, right it helps us take control take control of you know our planet of sustainability and of the issues the, the bigger macro objectives of, of society take control of our wallets of our spending of our energy bills uh, take control as well of security of supply so you're not beholden to foreign geopolitical forces, as we heard earlier from, from our politician. So you can take a lot more control of what's happening around you and, and, and hope to contribute uh, to a greater good, but also help manage your own needs and, and, and your finances. So that's one kind of group of potential benefits and advantages to engaging in self-consumption and collective um, energy communities. Um, and we see that the crisis has allowed us all to really accelerate our thinking and awareness of these, these benefits and to do what we can to, to take things into our own hands. Of course, it helps, it helps that technology has made it easier and that things have become cheaper. Solar panels were well out of even our range um, only a few years ago. But every, every year passes and, and we see the, if you will, the trends, the cost trends for these technologies and, and every day they're more and more accessible. Uh, to more of us, and I think that's important as well. And I can tell you, I mean, my day job, I'm in the Portuguese regulator, and in the last two years, so I just have some numbers, I like numbers. Um, in 2021, self-consumption, so solar panels, they grew 194% in one year. So people really went out and tried to get solar panels. And we're not a rich country, as you may know. So, and in 2022, this increase was 170%. So the last couple of years has been a massive increase in solar panel installations, um, you know, in a very practical way in Portugal. And I think there's some reasons for that, some drivers, um, but certainly some enablers, in, including the, the accessibility, the price. Even IKEA, I, I think everybody probably knows IKEA is selling solar panels. So um, they've reached to us in Portugal. So. Indeed, self-consumption, digital things that can help us, that can help with energy efficiency, um, with energy sufficiency, using the energy that's produced at the right times um, in a more effective way. Um, they can st all still provide us some price and behavioral signals as a society, but as individuals, so that's important. There are financial benefits. You might even be able to sell your excess power back to the system. Environmental benefits, we already talked about, security supply, we already talked about. But this is all sounding too good to be true. Um, and it's, it's a process, and there is a long um, way to go, and there are still some challenges. We know there are administrative burdens. Um, setting up an energy community is not easy. It's not for your average person on the street. You need somebody like an AGM to help you uh, through the system to manage even billing and information obligations, etc. You're balancing responsible who? You know, so these things, they are in the back office, but they still need to be done so that the entire system um, isn't jeopardized. So that, that's a major challenge, um, and it's going back to this um, trade-off between the sophistication and the simplicity and the, the independence and democracy of energy, if you will. So that's important. Um, financial barriers, it's still not for everybody, if, whether you have the potential to actually invest. Cybersecurity concerns is something we always come back to, you know, the data and the profiling and the information and, and how it can be used for or against you. And just this complexity barrier and the social barrier that, that can present to different types of people. And ultimately, we can't forget, we're not all digital. There is such a thing as digital exclusion. 
either by choice or by circumstance. And that's really important. And we can't just say, oh, the future is technology and smartphones and Star Trek and everything's going to be super easy. Uh, many of us still have uh, different uh, uh, interests, choices, but also different capabilities. So that's important. Um, we forget, you know, we think internet, computers, uh, smart meters are everywhere. They're not everywhere and not everybody wants them and not everybody can have them or is able to interact with them. Um, at the moment, I think our statistics are about 54% of Europe has smart meters. So that seems high and it's growing every year. Um, in Portugal, we should be done with our rollout in 2024. So still not everybody has them either. And then the question is, are they really smart? Do they actually work? And perversely, we were just even discussing it this morning in, in, in amongst the regulators is, is the system ready for such active customers? Can it handle the data and the traffic of information that's needed to be a fully engaged and interactive system um, where we're all participating? And in, in the reality is no. Uh, our energy systems aren't totally prepared to, to handle the traffic that we want. Um, and I don't mean cars, but you know, data is traffic. And that is the future, and uh, we will be more and more dependent on data. So then we can ask ourselves in another conference <laughs> to what extent have we become too dependent on data. But we need uh, smart solutions. Um, there is this perpetual mismatch you know, between when the energy, solar panels, produce the energy and when we all want to consume. And so we've been very spoiled if we can consume any energy we want at any time of the day or night uh, to any limit possible. So maybe there have to be some kind of, not profiles, but we have to be a bit more responsible when we can use the energy and, and how. Um, but that comes with flexibility, with batteries, with smart pricing models to encourage people to not plug in as soon as they get home from work, but to maybe plug in or program, like you program your dishwasher, program it to start right, charging your car at 2 in the morning. So lots of different things we all need to do to be smarter, to be more efficient, to be more sufficient as well, as, as Maureen was saying, I think. And um, ultimately to make sure that we make uh, these different possibilities available to vulnerable consumers and to energy poor. And you can do this through municipal programs, through partnerships, through schemes that um, install these different solar panels or other solutions in, in buildings where there are many tenants and you find different ways to, to make such energy and those solutions not only an elite uh, opportunity. So I think the market design proposals try to go in that, a little bit in that direction, pick up on some of these issues, but certainly it's, it's something we all have to contribute to in our different, uh, in our different fields and, and areas of responsibility. Thanks, Natalie. I think that point about the, this, the slogan or the message of taking control, that consumers could take control, is a very appealing one. We saw it work in the Brexit referendum. We know it's an appealing, appealing notion, um, but also, we can't overpromise another lesson from the Brexit referendum that you can't overpromise that the technology is going to be a, a panacea that delivers everything. It takes a lot of other um, elements. Uh, let me put a um, question that's come in from online Justin. Let me put this to you. So the question is from Rainer Lutkehus. Um, don't we need an obligation for DSOs to install smart meters? We don't have that in Germany. I would point out we don't have them in Belgium either. Um, Rainer, for, for types of projects like you're doing, is that really a prerequisite that the DSOs need to, that the governments need to require the DSOs, or maybe at EU level we need to require them to roll out smart meters? Yeah, so, so I'm not a regulator, so I thought they already had, no. and in the Netherlands that is definitely the case, and that makes our work that we do as, as an energy uh, um, uh, service provider so much easier and so much better. And um, this, uh, if we have um, uh, solar panels, windmills, and consumption, and we want to match that at the same time, we need as much data as we can to really fit these profiles. And if we don't have this data because we get it once a year and it's probably false, then, then it won't work. So I was convinced this was already the case, so the answer would be yes, I guess, <laughs> right? Yeah, not here in Belgium. And Natalie, would, do you think we need this obligation? I think smart meters are the key to making all of these things possible in the future. And, uh, okay, the legislation allows us to do cost-benefit analyses, and in the past, maybe the business case wasn't so strong for smart meters everywhere. Um, but again, you know, technology gets cheaper and cheaper. And uh, I think now we're saying 
if I'm remembering correctly, in, in Portugal, a smart meter, including the installation, is about 40 euros per household. So it's becoming more and more possible to roll out uh, on a massive scale. And so it's important, I think, for many countries. I don't want to pick on Germany, but it is the biggest uh, member state that still has not um, considered or proceeded with a smart metering program. That's true. Monique, I think you want to come in on Belgium, right? Uh, well, I, I mean, I don't have a smart meter uh, for the moment because in Wallonia it's not really being rolled out in massively, but they are starting to work on it. But what I wanted to say is, uh, indeed, I think that smart meters are part of the of the IT that is needed to get the maximum out of it. Uh, currently, in the past, and certainly currently, most of the smart meters are only smart for the providers, not for the people. And you really need to... Uh, I mean, if you want people on board and if you want them to embrace the technology, you really need to reassure them because taking control, they want to take control of the energy consumption. They don't want to be taking control of. They don't want anybody to spy on them. And that's the message that needs to be really made. It, it is for the, I mean, there is no safeguard that is being given for the moment that all smart meters are protecting your privacy. And so this is something that is a huge part. If you want to have a massive take up, you really need to reassure the people about this. And it's not the case everywhere. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, let's move on to the third panel, which is on customer contracts in a digital era. So a nice segue there when we're thinking about the relationship between the consumers and their providers. Uh, for this panel, we have Anna Johansson, Vice Chair of the Customers and Retail Services Committee at Euroelectric. And we have Els Brugman, Head of Policy and Enforcement at Teste Shop, the Belgian Consumer Association, and Euro Consumers. So Anna, let's start with you. When we're I think we've been dancing around the issue of contracts so far, so now we can really dive into it. How do we get consumers fully engaged in new possibilities for innovative contracts, which, as I admitted before, probably like most consumers, I just sign up to whatever the provider tells me to sign up to. Yeah, hi. So my name is Anna Johansson, and I'm uh, not only the vice chair of the retail committee of Euroelectric, but I'm working in Vattenfall in Sweden uh, as a senior portfolio owner. Uh, and uh, I have some slides, and I just briefly, Vattenfall is a 100% state-owned company with 7.1 million customers, and our main market as electricity supplier is the Nordics, uh, Germany, and the Netherlands. So uh, going into the topic today, then, we are talking about digitalization, and it has really been, I mean, we are talking about digitalization in the electricity market for a very long time, but I would say that it's not until now that it actually starts to make sense and give real value to the customers and it's the current market conditions and the volatility and high prices that probably has driven that development forward quite a lot so going forward in the slides we can move one slide ahead uh, so i would say that the experience from the past years uh, in the nordics and uh, i'm in Sweden, so I'm talking a lot about the Swedish market, is that it's really smart meters that you just talked about, that it's, it's really is the key prerequisite uh, to uh, enable customers' particip participation uh, in innovative and digital contracts. And in the Nordics, all households are equipped with uh, smart meters, in Sweden, the first generation of smart meters was rolled out in 2009. And now, as we speak, this, the next generation meters are being rolled out that enable quarterly metering and also give a customer interface with the possibility to give like near real-time data access for the end customer. And, and as you already stated that in Europe, the, the situation is very different depending on which country you are in. And I think that the ACE report says 54% had a smart meter and may, maybe they are not as smart still some of them even though they are at, at least remotely uh, yeah exactly um, but i think that by using digital tools in combination with the smart meters that customers can understand the price they pay for the energies they, they use uh, and also how they can adapt their consumption to save energy and also costs so on the right hand side this is a screenshot from the my pages that as a swedish customer to vattenfall if you have a hourly spot price contract uh, this chart actually states it's not the 
price of electricity tomorrow, it's not the energy consumption, but it's actually the price that you are paying for each hour, which you can see here. So I think that for, for this specific uh, customer, the actual price of the day and the consumption is not harmonizing because the customer has probably used the information to sort of shift their behavior. Uh, and this really gives transparency to how much does it cost me today and then you can uh, toggle a bit and you can see the weeks and you can compare to the previous year and how much did it cost me then and how much did I consume and so on. And this is of course not a development that we as Vattenfall, uh, sort of the incumbent, is, is driving. It's very, very much driven from the startups, new players in the market, but customers are then expecting everyone to be able to provide this of course because that is they, they are seeing that you have to be in control currently. You want to feel that you actually know how much you're going to pay. Even though it's a high price, at least I know that it is a high price. So I can expect when it's time to pay my bill, how much the bill will, will be. Um, and the, of course, this includes services also on like uh, demand response and steer, smart steering of uh, electric vehicles, but I think that the uptake for that is really quite modest still. So it's really the digitalization here, it's really about awareness and understanding and how I can like take control and, and do something for my own costs and, and energy consumption. Uh, and as all of this sounds very nice and we are offering it, it our customers really using it or, or benefiting from this, uh, during the past year, we have seen in the Nordics and in Sweden, also in Finland, that customers are to a very high extent not renewing to a new fixed price because the fixed price contracts have been so expensive, but rather shifting to a more variable price contract and to a large extent also the hourly spot price contract, which is made, which is largely available. I think there are at least 100 suppliers who are offering uh, dynamic price contracts, hourly spot price contracts. And uh, according to official agency statistics, in March, 10.5% of all household customers in Sweden were on a dynamic price contract, hourly spot contract. So this has totally taken over. Uh, and to conclude my presentation, it's clear that customers are really ready to enter the digital era also for their electricity contracts but for that to give real benefits to customers, the right prerequisites <clears throat> have to be in place. And I think that uh, there is no question that the smart meter is an essential key for the digital transition to, uh, of the electricity retail market to really take off. Yeah, and it's those prerequisites that are really the key because you could have the most innovative contract in the world, but if you don't have the tools to actually exercise it, it wouldn't be of much use. Els, let's turn to you next. So what have you found at national level here in Belgium about how you can get consumers more interested in innovative contact, uh, contracts and more aware of the possibilities of innovative contracts? Uh, thank you. Well, first of all, I, I would like to apologize because as a Belgian consumer organization, we're also a member of Berg, so I apologize in advance for possible overlaps. You will notice that very much. We often think alike. Um, now, having that said, um, I also have three key messages for you, um, but I'm going to cheat a little bit. Sorry, Dave. Um, I'm going to start with a bit of a, a, a preliminary consideration because as a Belgian consumer organization, I just want to stress that we also see digitalization as an immense opportunity, if not a precondition, uh, to make the shift to green energy because it can be a crucial missing link in turning Belgian consumers really into active consumers. Um, recently, we added a tagline to our logo and it's empower people, improve the market. And really, this is what this is all about by really empowering consumers also when it comes to energy, having them taking matters into their own hand and really use this collective power, they can help steer uh, a shift to green energy. And for this, digitalization obviously is a game changer. So for us, it's not about sustainability or digi digital or vice versa. 
it is really, as Belgian consumer organization, about how can we make this work for consumers. And this involves having also more uh, innovative contracts. I mean, if you say digital, it immediate pop, immediately pops up. It's the digital meter. And, and obviously, because it really allows consumers to have control uh, over their energy bills, which has proven to be very crucial uh, in the last year, but also monitor their energy consumption. Um, we were talking about Belgium. Um, <laughs> for the moment, we have about like half a million of consumers doing this, which is around 30% of all households with digital meters. So needless to say, it's still baby steps, and there's quite some, uh, some uh, room for improvement. I myself would like to have one myself, uh, a digital meter, but uh, I'm on a waiting list. Um, but we know that the ones who have a digital meter in February 2023, they consumed 35% less than in 2022. So it is very useful. But to really capture the upside of these digital meters, this should also be reflected in more innovative contracts. For example, contracts that allow you to pay, um, to pay per month based on your real consumption instead of you know, being kept in the dark uh, until the annual bill arrives. Um, in Flanders, at least, for the moment, uh, large suppliers are obliged to do this, but it's really, really in its baby shoes. The downside is, of course, that you will need to pay m way more in, in, in winter time when you consume more, and this can be a real risk for vulnerable households. That's why, as consumer organization, and despite some policy people really pushing to be having these contracts to become the new normal, for us, it still needs to be a choice. It needs to be up to the consumer to decide we opt for this or we don't opt for this. Another innovation offered by digital meters, and it's mentioned here already uh, many times, it's of course the dynamic price contracts because they really allow for the mind side flexibility and can stimulate consumers to make the shift from you know, times where prices are high to times uh, where the, the, the prices are lower. But also this is maybe not yet for every consumer. For the moment, it's really interesting for the larger households, ones with you know, a heat pump or an electric car, but even more importantly, it really requires a mind shift in the heads of consumers on how to cope with electricity consumption, and they have no experience with this yet. So if we want to make this work, and we do want to make this work, then it really should go in hand with easy to use tools, intelligent control system, transparent tariffs, proper protection, and very importantly, consumers' flexibility needs to be monetized. It needs to be reflected in lower bills. Um, if we want to engage them and, and promote it, this is very crucial. So in short, these contracts, they need to bring value to consumers. They need to take away the barriers and bring in the benefits. They need to be designed with consumers in hearts and minds if we want to make this work. So this would be my, my first message. But, and this is the second one, Let's not forget about the basics. Um, we can talk about innovative contracts as much as we want, but in the end, let's start with first things first. Every good contract starts with good information, and that's no different in the digital area. Um, and unfortunately, in 2023, we see that's still uh, a problem. You know, we mentioned the variable, co uh, variable contracts where there are like dozens for consumers, absolutely incomprehensible parameters. I mean, they have no idea what they sign, sign up for. And imagine what will happen if we introduce more and more dynamic contracts that can be even more complex. Um, so transparency in tariffs and pre-contractual information is, is, is one thing. Of course, digital comparison tools can be a, a very important tool to empower consumers, you know, what is the right price? What is the best deal? I can compare, I can switch, and I can boost competition under the condition that these comparison tools are indeed trustworthy and, and reliable. Um, so we need to make sure that those tools on the market, um, they need to be complete. They need to cover the entire market. So also including, for example, offers coming from energy communities. Um, they need to be tra transparent. Um, you know, make a clear indication. If there's a sponsored offer, okay, but make, make sure that consumers can know about it. And very importantly, it needs to be easy to use. And, and this brings me to my, to my final point, mind the digital gap. 46% um, 
of Belgian consumers have a risk of digital inclusion, either because they don't have the digital skills or they don't have access. 27% of all low-educated consumers over 55 never goes online. And one out of five households who are in a vulnerable position, they don't have access to internet. Yes, digital tools, digital contracts, they can be a huge game changer and they can really encourage, uh, make the shift from a passive consumer that just pays the bills every month to, be, to a more active one that indeed produces, consumes, uh, stores or even sells its own energy. But equally important is to make sure that no one is left behind. Um, and that everyone can benefit from the innovation that this has to offer. Um, vulnerable consumers, vulnerable families, they risk not only to be excluded, they risk to pay even more for their energy. And, and honestly, as consumer organization, this is a paradox we cannot accept. Thanks a lot. So I think we have, we have three Belgian residents here and none of us have a smart meter. <laughs> Just have a stroke. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd be curious. So, how many people in this room, let's say, how many people in this room live in Belgium and have a smart meter? One, <laughs> two. two, okay. Wow. Um, I didn't even know there was a wait list, actually, so I'll have to check that. Um, okay, let's open it up to the audience for questions. Uh, does anyone have a question for the panelists? Uh, uh, we have one from online here. So this question is from Lorenzo Rodriguez. Um, what tools exist today for consumers to easily hold their suppliers accountable? Um, Anna, do you want to take that? Are there tools that, and then I'll also put this to Els. Are there tools that can help? Yeah, I don't know really what's meant by holding your supplier accountable. <laughs> Um, I would say that as a supplier, of course, you have to stick to the rules and uh, there are a lot of regulation that we are complying to and that also gives the customer quite sort of good way to if there is something that isn't working well to 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 complain and to get to get things sorted out. If you are with a, a serious supplier, then the supplier will, of course, try to understand your issues and, and try to solve uh, the 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 problems that you have. Um, Els, I guess one of the, the key things to hold a supplier in any industry accountable is competition, which is something we don't have so much of in the energy sector in Belgium. So how do you, if you don't have a lot of choice for your supplier, your supplier isn't delivering you the smart meter that you want, how do you hold them accountable? Well, uh, the best tool is, of course, your consumer organization. <laughs> no. <laughs> the ombudsman. Or the ombudsman, yeah. Um, but I'm going to uh, preach for my, own, uh, for my own company, for my own organization. Uh, yes, indeed. I mean, it's a huge problem. And I can say you, uh, we have been flooded by complaints coming from consumers with suppliers not delivering. Um, also, on a, on, on a personal note, I have to say it's very difficult to get, uh, you know, uh, and, and I think we are people who know consumer law and uh, know our rights, it's really difficult to have them respected. Um, just to say, I, I am a, a, a customer and I have relative good knowledge, I'm easy with, you know, digital tools, so I opted for a digital contract and then there was a mistake in, in, in my billing, so I wanted to raise the ball. And I wrote to them because I cannot use the call center because I don't pay for the call center. And since September, uh, since, no, since January, I've been sending how many reminders? I mean, we're June, uh, May, June, I still haven't got a response. So luckily, I know where my consumer organization is and I was able to raise the ball with them. Uh, just to say, yes, it does, there's a huge role for, for regulators um, and, and there's a huge role, I think, for consumer organizations to you know, defend their rights and really enforce them. Yeah, Monique just pointed out sometimes going on Twitter can be helpful for that, for sure. Um, do we have uh, any questions for any of the panelists from the first session? Uh, any questions from the audience? Yes, right over here. Yep, uh, if you want to hit the microphone button there. Hi, uh, I'm uh, Bram Kleis with the Regulatory Assistance Project. Um, I have a, a question. I think we're um, 
trying to combine two very important goals here. Um, we want to be consumer centric and, and protect consumers, especially in times of crisis. Um, and at the same time, uh, also want to unlock decentralized flexibility with, with consumers. Um, now, <clears throat> I think in this market reform, there's rightfully so a lot of attention to improving um, consumer protection. Um, disconnections shouldn't be allowed, etc. And there's attention to contract uh, types of contracts that are offered to consumers at regulated or competitive prices. Now, the question is, in your experience, do you see an opportunity to combine tariffs, uh, contract types for vulnerable consumers that at the same time um, protect as well as support flexibility? Um, can you imagine? And if so, how? Um, and is there any regulatory intervention that might be useful uh, to stimulate this combination of protection as well as flexibility? Who would like to take that? Um, that's really Sorry, it's a really complex question, but very uh, to the point, and uh, I don't have an easy fix solution for that. I mean, if I would have it, we could do it with a finger clip, and, and that's not the case. Um, but I think uh, what I mentioned before is um, it's all about designing systems, designing contracts with, you know, having consumers and also vulnerable consumers in, in, in mind. I mean, no, bridging the digital gap, it starts there, really empowering them, educating, but also safeguarding them, protecting them in case there's something uh, goes, goes wrong. And it can also be the case for, for vulnerable consumers. Uh, but it really requires a defined, a refined architecture um, to, to, to be able to, to deliver this. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we have lots of intelligent people around the table. I'm pretty sure if we put all of our heads together that it should be possible. Yeah. Monique? Yeah. Uh, if I can complete uh, what Elle said, I also think that it's not necessarily a contradiction between protection and flexibility. You can still put safeguards into the system because uh, flexibility is about playing with prices. There are so many other elements of protection that you can build into a flexible contract. For example, a good complaints handling system, a help desk, availability of somebody at the end of the phone, uh, or at least, you know. So there is a lot of... Um, measures that can be put into a contract that can protect sufficiently people, even if they take a risk with the price element, I would say. Mm -hmm. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Oh, yes, we have another one from online. So this question is from Annabella Bruegel. What is the role of consumer behavior analysis in our current regulatory framework? Could we use AI, possibly, to produce better legal and regulatory frameworks. So how do we know, how much do we know about how consumers behave? Adelie, do you want to take that? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. And in fact, for the most part, we don't know enough. And um, few of us have really a handle on AI, big data, and all the different kinds of information you can, or profiling, understanding um, behavior um, and consumer preferences. And I mean, the marketing and the publicity industry, they've made a science out of this. They know exactly how to you know, trigger and understand what people will do and what they want. But in energy, less so. And certainly uh, as regulators, but also as suppliers, there's a lot more we can do um, to really understand the consumers. And we're not all the same, you know, the complexities of people that uh, Marion was talking about earlier. Uh, but we can do quite a lot more now trying to understand our irrationality. We're all, to a certain extent, Irrational, irrational animals. So, yes, we can use it a lot more. Um, there's a lot of thought about how that can be done, and uh, including um, some of us are, as regulators are very active in a group in the OECD, uh, it's a network of economic regulators, and it brings together the telecoms, the energy, the water, and the, lots of different solutions and ideas, and some, some regulators really are experimenting and using them to decide traffic light patterns or water use um, and prices. And you can go quite far 
um, increasingly so uh, in using this kind of uh, analysis of behaviors and patterns to, to decide what's best and what's working and what's not working. So I think all of us can kind of learn a lot from this new, if you will, new field. I think telecoms regulators probably look further down the road as maybe you might expect they would be. Um, but certainly for, for energy, I think there is a lot we can learn and that we can start to think about how to apply and, uh, and adapt based on the information. Um, given that the, the information is limited, Maureen, I'd be curious to get your perspective on this. When you talk to regulators at a national or EU level, how, how good is their knowledge of how consumers behave? Do you think there are misperceptions among regulators about how energy consumers behave? I think regulators should be talking way more with researchers that are really working on those issues. Uh, you can, can move from behavioral economists to sociologists uh, to, uh, to also uh, political scientists. Uh, so there are many, many different fields of research that are possible to, 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 to use, but they, they should also be some kind of way more regularly some focus groups. I mean, we do focus groups about shampoo. Why don't we do focus groups about uh, energy expectations. expectations? Thank you, Monique. Um, <laughs> we make a great team, huh? <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so it's, it's really about going back to the lived experience uh, because there is absolutely no one size fits all. And the problem with regulation is that we try to make everything work into little little boxes whereas it actually should be the contrary somehow and I, I won't say that I believe in light regulation I don't know it's not my job to, do, to say anything like that it's just that it has to take into account way more the the, 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 the way people live and not the way we would like them to be really just would like to really insist on that i think i mean technology uh, i mean ai is technology at the next level okay mm -hmm. but nothing is replacing anything like talking to the people and when you speak about consumer protection it's not only speaking about consumers it's speaking with consumers mm -hmm. and just asking them what they expect asking them how they live watching them doing sometimes things consumer focus group it's it's maybe expensive but it really gets to the granularity of how different groups of different people in different countries are, um, you know, experiencing what needs they express, uh, what, uh, what fears they express, because you also need to, uh, uh, um, uh, to address the fears. So I think really uh, investing in having uh, its, demo, its energy democracy, to some extent, uh, really asking the people what they really want. Not asking necessarily, the researchers are a tool also. Uh, but sometimes researchers can also be biased by their research. Uh, it's the people who need to pay the bill at the, at the end of the day. Well, I think that's a good note to wrap up session one on. How about a round of applause for all of our session one panelists? So we're going to take a 15-minute coffee break now. You can uh, head out here to the coffee if you're in the room. If you're watching from home, I invite you to your own kitchen to make yourself a coffee. Uh, we'll meet back here at 4.50 to start the next session, which will be on customer engagement, lessons from the energy crisis in a digital era. So see you back here in 15 minutes.
Okay, if everybody could take their seats, we'll get started in just a moment. Please take, please take your seats. We'll start in just a minute. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Okay, we're now going to move on to session two. Session two is uh, devoted to empowering cons empowered consumers avenues for a post-crisis energy transition. So now we're really going to be thinking about moving on from the crisis, hopefully, well, hopefully moving on from the crisis, not returning to crisis. How can we make consumers empowered to help themselves in a situation of increased energy prices in the context, of course, as well, of increased cost of living? Our first panel will be on revamping the EU electricity market design for retail markets and consumers. This has been a very thorny and very political topic at the European Council uh, over many months. I, I would actually say over a year now. Um, and so this is something that the Commission is working on at the request of member states. It is an ongoing process. We're very fortunate to have here with us today Adela Tesorova, uh, who is head of unit for consumers, local initiatives, and just transition at the European Commission's Energy Department. And we have Jean-Michel Glachon, professor at the Sorbonne and at the Florence School of Regulation. So Adela, let's start with you. As I mentioned, this is a hot topic at the moment. So uh, what is the Commission's thinking right now in terms of the future of EU electricity market design? Uh, thank you very much and good afternoon everyone. Uh, I think the room is full of experts, so I will look forward uh, to the discussion. Um, as you know, the, uh, the reform uh, of the electricity market design uh, was presented in March. Um, it is a reform that combines wholesale and uh, retail uh, market uh, reforms. Um, the objective is to reduce exposure of consumers to wholesale market fluctuation, increase investment in renewables, empower consumers even more than before and also protect them better and, and enhance their rights. As we have seen that consumers were the weaker part during the crisis and very much suppliers have been shifting risks towards the consumers. So some lessons learned from the crisis have been incorporated into the proposal. Um, 
And I think it's also important to keep in mind that the relevance of the market design reform for consumers is not only limited to the retail market provisions, yeah, because if suppliers have more renewables in their portfolio, uh, if they, um, uh, if they, um, you know, the, the support schemes that are being used uh, are no longer linked to wholesale market, we will see, we, we expect to see uh, that the average prices that suppliers will be charging to consumers will be lower. Yeah, so that's what, uh, what the reform is trying to achieve. And also, of course, is trying to uh, make it easier for consumers to access renewables directly. Also for those who are, for example, tenants or they cannot invest in renewables themselves. Uh, so through the uh, energy sharing concept, uh, we would um, make uh, renewable and energy directly accessible to those who normally cannot access it. Um, so that's an important uh, aspect for both for advancing renewables, but also for more socially fair green transition, so that renewable energy is not uh, kind of left to um, high-income groups only, but it's available to everyone. Um, and of course, there are also some additional safeguards to better pro uh, protect consumers. We have less land from the crisis. For example, when suppliers were breaking fixed price contracts or were no longer offering them, so the proposal is trying to correct this to kind of introduce some additional obligations on suppliers in this area and also to, um, uh, to protect the most vulnerable from disconnections. Um, and when necessary, the proposal is also allowing member states to intervene in retail prices during a crisis situation, if necessary. But of course, we believe that the market design reform would actually reduce the need for any crisis price interventions by member states because simply we would see less uh, impact of any wholesale market uh, price increases on consumers. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, an interesting point that the reform in the proposal would uh, negate the need for any price intervention. I think that's a big discussion now with, with governments as, the, as they digest the proposal. Um, Jean-Michel, let's move on to you. What does your research tell you about what is the ideal regulatory design and how do we get, how do we get there? Does the proposal help get us there? The most important thing is not what is the best regulatory design. The most important thing, as being said, is the former panel. It is that revolution is started in the electricity system in all its parts. New supply tech, decentralized generation, prosumers, new consumption tech, flexible consumers, flexible load, EVs, heat pumps, storage, digital transaction. We can group consumers. We can share directly between consumers. We do not need intermediaries. And fourth, new electricity system, multi-level system. Of course, there is transmission grid and big generators, but there is also smaller generators and distribution grids, and there is also very small generator with no grids, peer-to-peer -peer or grouping energy communities. So revolution is started, but it is not implemented in the regulatory frame. I do not blame regulators. I know the difficulties. I know their responsibilities. They are responsible vis-a-vis -vis the entire society. As it is, they cannot change the society at will. They cannot make local deals for local issues. So they have terrible constraints. However, five changes have to be made. They are enormous. First one, metering, submetering. It is ridiculous to say to a consumer, you have only one meter, I don't care. A consumer has the right to have various meters, so submetering. So private measurement of some consumption, the EV, the heat pump, and many other things can be done and taken into account by the official metering by the official regulated company for metering. Second, aggregating, sharing, grouping. Individuals can be forgotten if they want to. 
Individuals can be put together, sharing peer-to-peer. -peer. And they can create groups, well, well, well said in the former session. They are communities, they take collective decisions, and they are collective billings, collective settlement. Third, in this context, what is the meaning of a single universal distribution connected connection contract? It has no meaning. We have different services. For each service, we can have different types of guarantees. We cannot have any more only universal contracts. Distribution tariff, but the same. If we have different services and for each different guarantees, we cannot have a single universal tariff. And fifth, it already exists in the Netherlands, in UK and, and somewhere else, local market operation on distribution grids. So who is defining the characteristic of the service? The market operator. Who is defining the authorized players? The market operator. Who is defining the price is king? The market operator. Who is defining the rule for metering and settlement? Again, the market operator. There is not any more universal service, universal tariff, it's dead but it's not officially dead. When will it be officially said? When we will have millions of EVs and we have already millions of heat pumps and millions of prosumers, in Portugal, said Natalie, it's doubling every year. One day, somebody will say, universal service, universal tariff exists for the poor because it's absolute duty to protect them for ordinary consumers, because they cannot understand in another type of contract, but it's dead for the advanced consumers. So in the coming seven years, it will be said, said dead by Natalie or Charles or uh, Anne Gret. We will see who. I made my best. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, super interesting. Let's go and check uh, if there's questions from the audience or online. Do we have any questions live in the room? No, any questions that have come in online? No, so Adela, I had one follow-up question for you. So, I mean, if you take into account what uh, Jean-Michel is saying about the most important thing is basically to have the revolution that is started recognized in the regulatory framework, right? So that you, things are moving very fast and whenever you have a policy area when things are moving very fast, those are the times when it's very hard for regulation to keep up, right? So are you confident that the proposal that the commission has just come up with is future-proof? Because some say this was kind of forced by member states to be drawn up very quickly uh, and is also trying, they're trying to push it through to adoption very quickly. Can we be sure that this is future-proof for the way that this technological revolution is going? Uh, well... I think the, um, it was already the clean energy package uh, that is very much future-proof and that enables most of these things already, but has not been implemented, as you also said. So one, th one thing is to have future-proof legislation, and I think we have been on a very good track since the clean energy package, but we have a huge implementation gap. And a lot of the things that we are now addressing with the market design, for example, when it comes to flexibility, are things that have not been implemented through the clean energy package. So we are regulating a bit further to unlock these barriers that have been still there. And either through lack of implementation or through other things that just simply did not materialize. Yeah. Um, so I think we are all certainly, um, but what I, I agree that the crisis has triggered consumer interest and that's something we didn't have before. And I'm very grateful for that. It was painful for many people it is still painful for many people, but this is what we need. We need people to be interested, because why don't you know people don't renovate? People did not renovate their houses, didn't install solar panels, because they didn't need it. They were paying their invoices without any problem. But all of a sudden, people are interested and they want to be actors in the transition, because they don't want to be passive recipient of potentially very high invoices. So this is very good. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a very good point. We've seen, obviously, these top, everyone in this room knows that these topics have been discussed for a very long time. But now 
the people sitting around the kitchen table are discussing them. The leaders sitting around the European Council table are discussing them. And it's given these issues an urgency and a political urgency that I think is, is leading to action where action might not have been coming so quickly. Okay, thanks for that, guys. We'll come back to you in the, the main Q&A for the session. Let's go on to the second panel, uh, which is on the role of clean technologies and green offers. To discuss this, we have Jana Hasova, uh, Vice President of the Council of European Energy Regulators, and Lisbeth Switten, Secretary General of the Association of Issuing Bodies, AIB. Jana, let's start with you. What would you say is needed in terms of information to consumers to enable these tools we've been talking about so far today? Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Uh, of course, in information. And information we receive every day, a lot of information. And we have to uh, receive trustworthy information. And we have to be able to find a way through uh, and make uh, uh, well, uh, well, uh, mm, well de defined choices because uh, they are choices we have to live with. So starting with uh, that one uh, general message, uh, I would like to not to scare you with the energy crisis. Uh, we've been talking uh, too long about it. But as every crisis, it brings also some opportunities and challenges. It speeds up processes. And uh, as, as stated uh, currently by Adela, it also such a negative uh, uh, situation can bring some positive light into it and speeds up processes and once the energy became that expensive people began to speak at their uh, kitchen tables about the energy and also it raises uh, really a lot of awareness despite uh, how, how negative it, it impacted uh, the, the society um, so looking into the uh, also the next slide uh, what we what what's the future well functioning uh, retail market uh, for energy consumers. We have to go digital, we have discussed in the session one, we have to go local, and we have to also go green, right? That's, that's the aim, and uh, we are reaching to it, and as I have mentioned, uh, we are speeding up the processes of going green. Um, on my next slide uh, is a reminder of what was uh, also mentioned by Annegret at the beginning, uh, that is the empowering consumers uh, for the energy transition. Uh, Empowering consumers for the energy transition means also to have uh, the broader look into the system as such and to find from that one, and there you can see consumer centric design, sustainable, efficient infrastructure, better functioning market, all those issues, energy uh, system integration, flexibility, uh, decentralized and local energy, all that has to work together and how to find the best and trustworthy information then after for the consumer to make uh, his, his choice as in this procedure. Uh, as it was also stated uh, by my previous speaker, uh, of course, by, by Natalie, and, and uh, what we uh, worked on uh, with, uh, with Biuk is the 2030 vision for energy consumers. You can find here, and as Natalie mentioned, all those principles, it's on the next slide, on affordability, protection, reliability. I was talking about reliable uh, information. It's important also to say a simple way of uh, informing consumers and also having the mi uh, in mind inclusiveness. We have to treat differently information for vulnerables and for people who can afford or who are more advanced in, in energy business. And we have, of course, to empower them. And also when speaking about empowering and speaking about uh, green energy, it's about uh, looking into currently all the prices are higher. And green energy was always set it's, it's more expensive than the normal uh, uh, energy. So is it still um, the way, uh, how it works now? How do we see it? How much information we receive about our consumption? Do we, do we really know how much uh, green energy we do uh, 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 need for our normal lives? So that is all we have to take into consideration. And um, that let's expire, it's a, it's a catchy title, but uh, the, the utmost important is the long-term way of thinking. Because currently, we, of course, we have to react to the situation, but we have to have in mind and keep in mind that it has to be a future-proof solution. And it was stated, of course, some 
provisions and important provisions from the clean package are still not being implemented in many countries. And also mentioning smart meter rollout is to up to 54 uh, percent, as was stated uh, in the previous session, which is not enough to uh, uh, gain what we can could gain from the system as such. Um, on my next slide, I would like to make a small announcement of a uh, uh, coming soon uh, papers here, uh, paper uh, guidelines on good practices for trust force information on green offers and consumer protection against uh, greenwashing. Um, what that means, uh, CIR looked already in uh, 2015 into uh, how to make uh, information on green offers uh, reliable, trust foresee for consumers, how it has to look like. And um, recently we looked into the, uh, the previous recommendations, whether they are still fit for purpose in line with the legislation, in line with uh, what happened on the market and how the market evolves. And we looked up uh, for how to uh, how to assure that on the market and also in terms of, of green offers, how to find the best way through how to get to reliable information. So we looked into uh, those, uh, made a revision of those of those recommendations, uh, specifically also, or we can divide them into blocks of providing access to adequate and reliable information to consumers, in threatening consumer trust by improving the existing disclosure systems, and the third block is uh, dedicated to supporting consumers with uh, transparent information. So that is uh, currently, that being said, uh, maybe too, too much at one, at one stage, but happy to discuss uh, later on in the discussion session. Great, thanks, Yana. So let's move on to Elizabeth. So Elizabeth, tell us a little bit about the role of issuing bodies in helping consumers take advantage of clean technologies and green offers. On the other hand, if indeed, if, if, if any outcome has, uh, if there has been any positive outcome of the current crisis, it is that uh, consumers are even more looking towards green, towards uh, renewable energy con uh, consumption. But it's uh, how to substantiate these claims, how to make sure that, that consumers can indeed be certain that the contract they close with their supplier is indeed a reliably green contract. And this is basically what, what, I, what I will focus on. In the past, there was a lot of concerns about uh, green claims and the question whether consumers can actually profit from reliable green offers. Well, over the past 20 years, this reliability has been firmly established in, uh, for electricity consumers mainly through two things. Uh, on one hand, we have the instrument of the guarantee of origin, and the secondly, there's the disclosure obligation for electricity suppliers. Uh, the guarantee of origin, GO, has been laid down in the renewable uh, energy directives and the disclosure obligation for suppliers in the internal um, electricity market directive. And I trust that all of you more or less know what a GO is, but here's a quick recap. So basically, this is a, a digital certificate that's issued in the registry of a national issuing body, uh, an organization that is appointed by that government to, to administer a system of GOs. Um, and this digital certificate is issued based on verified meter readings uh, from the production of a megawatt hours of renewable electricity. So it's basically tracking the attributes. And um, GOs can then be traded over Europe, uh, which uh, is standardized and facilitated by AIB, the Association of Issuing Bodies. And then next, any energy supplier who offers a green electricity contract to an end consumers needs to cancel the amount of GOs in the registry of its own local issuing body, corresponding to the amount of electricity it has supplied to that um, consumer under the name of renewable electricity. And also the invoice that the supplier sends to the consumer should record the origin of the supplied electri as electricity as proven with GEOs. In every country or region for Belgium, there is not only an issuing body for GEOs that administer the database, but there's also an authority supervising disclosure. In many cases, this is the NRA. 
Now, the system of GAOs has been harmonized to the widest extent, but um, with regard to disclosure practices, and, and I'm very happy that this is also part of the, the SEER uh, advice on green uh, offers, uh, the disclosure system is not uh, harmonized yet to the fullest extent in Europe. Because the idea behind all of this is that one megawatt hour of green electricity can only be accounted for once. So it's basically a book and claim system whereby 20 years ago already the physical flow of electricity is uncoupled from the attributes of the unit because you cannot track electrons over the grid. Um, and what is done is that the geo then contains the information of that specific unit of energy, possibly complemented with additional information. There is additionality possible. Labels are possible. There's the echo energy label so far, the tooth suit label, etc. And the system allows for consumer choice. And it has empowered con consumers all over Europe to consciously choose for a green electricity contract. In 2022, um, 840 of terawatt hours of geos have been traded internationally within Europe. The financial value of the geo markets is valued at a staggering 1.2 billion euros per year. The geo is no longer something that is in the corner. Uh, one geo is no longer at f 5 euro cents, 20 euro cents. No, it's an instrument that is worth 7 euros. Um, in, in, in Europe, that's the, the actual market price. Um, so since 2018, as you can see on the slide, the impact of energy tracking systems has grown even more with the introduction of geos for gases. That's both in biomethane and hydrogen. Also for heating and cooling, geos are being um, implemented. Additionally, uh, a system for tracking of renewable uh, and low-carbon transport fuels has been introduced, which is not governed by AIB. But what we see is that now all over Europe, uh, countries are rolling out their systems for uh, guarantees of origin for gases. Uh, only last week, e-control, the Austrian regulator, has been uh, appointed as the first AIB member, which is compliant to our uh, harmonized EEC standards. And uh, as of next month, they will be issuing uh, gas guarantees of origin for biomethane mainly uh, that will carry the, the, the EECS um, standard that are compliant with the EEC standards. And uh, seven or eight other members of AIB, so seven or eight uh, other countries within Europe are uh, currently applying within AIB for ski membership. And by the end of this year, we will see the first renewable gas geos transferred over that AIB hub. And as you can see on the slide right now, we have entered in an even a new era whereby we, whereby we see that a number of legislations are being drafted, which also have an impact or a potential impact on the GAO system, because there, is a, there are all kinds of tendencies ongoing. First of all, there's a tendency to add more granularity to GAOs, and so that energy production and consumption are better aligned, both in time and location-wise. Indeed, you can think a consumer living in Spain having renewable electricity, electricity supply that is cancelled with geos from Norway. Mm -hmm. So basically we are now trying, now that the system is mature, we are making that gradual movement towards more granularity to make um, consumption and production uh, match more closely and location as well. Uh, supplier disclosure is also being introduced in a gas package. So soon there will be an uh, so the disclosure obligation for gas suppliers as well, which is, of course, very positive. But there's also a number of other leg leg legislations popping up. There is the EU ETS that may have an impact, uh, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive. Uh, and it's important that also these um, legislations take the legal instrument of GOs into account in order to avoid double counting at all costs. Same applies with global supply chains for hydrogen, CBAM for product importers, and potentially also the Green Claims Directive. So all these initiatives contribute to the energy transition and to consumers having more impact on their consumption. The GO has proven its reliability and its use over the past 20 years. It's a solid and reliable system, and we call for a, a wider use and rec legal recognition of this instrument, not only for suppliers, but also for consumer disclosure. Some will argue that the, the GO in itself is not enough. Well, we don't dispute this, but the GO is the legal instrument at hand for energy attribute tracking. And it is possible to attach something else to it. So, for instance, the obligation of bundled sale, 
that there should be a physical link with, with the geo and a certain flow of electricity. That's possible. Just put it in legislation. Um, or that the electricity comes from a production device that is only in operation since a recent number of years. This is already information that is recorded on the geo. Or that emissions of a certain unit of energy shouldn't be more than a certain number, which can, that's also perfectly uh, able to record that information on a geo on that digital certificate. Uh, also, green labels can uh, be recorded as a day, uh, uh, on the geo because there is a data field. I mean, it's a digital certificate with basically all kinds of data fields. So there is a data field also for adding additional information should the local government, the local authority, uh, or the European um, legislator choose for it. Um, if we can reinforce the system of energy certificates through the legislation, through cooperation and further standardization, we can further exclude double claims because that is what we all want, that a certain unit of renewable energy can only be accounted for once. The system is there and this is a warm call for cooperation to move forward together. Don't skip the deal to prevent double claims. And this is uh, for consumers, for household consumers, who and also corporate consumers who have their supplier disclosure, but it's also for large corporates who sometimes want to disclose their energy consumption by themselves. Right now, they have to do it through um, supplier disclosure if they follow the legal system, which results in uh, sometimes reportings being done that are not according to, to this. And this is something that we want to avoid at all costs and what AIB will uh, continue to fight against. So uh, basically, that was um, in a nutshell the, the evolution that I wanted to say on the growing impact of energy tracking and the, the fact that energy tracking has empowered consumers over the past 20 years and it continues to be an instrument for reliable um, disclosure and uh, reliably um, fighting green claims. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. That's, uh, that's really interesting. Let me check if there's questions here in the room or online. In the room, no. Online, I don't think so. Elizabeth, I did have a, something that occurred to me while you were talking about the GOs, is that, oh wait, let me take, I'll take the audience question first, then I'll ask you my question, first one. I myself. Okay. <laughs> um, so the question is from Ricardo Santos. Uh, Elizabeth, it's for you as well. Uh, you mentioned that the system of disclosure is not yet harmonized enough. What is the main purpose of such harmonization and what steps must still be taken? Well, basically, uh, so basically the issuing bodies, uh, we, we are gathered in, in the AIB, which is by basically an international nonprofit organization, by the way. What we see is the dialogue that we have between, amongst the issuing bodies, whereby we standardize the system, we go for, for uh, more reliability, we exchange best practice, etc. That system does not, ex that does not exist for disclosure competent authorities. Uh, so basically, disclosure competent authorities did not until recently have a forum where they can jointly standardize, exchange best practices, etc. At AIB, we have tried to, uh, to accommodate for that. We have now set up a disclosure platform since two years. This uh, platform meets twice uh, a year. And until now, it's been mostly an exchange of best practices. For instance, you have the Flemish regulator reg with their uh, origin comparator, which is, is a tool that can be of an inspiration to other disclosure competent authorities. Because as Jana told, disclosure is also about giving information to the general public, making sure that consumer trust in this reliable tr system can grow. And so uh, in that respect, we, we still are lagging behind uh, in terms of, of disclosure competent authorities. That apart from the fact that uh, many of the disclosure competent authorities in Europe are very, very badly understaffed and under-resourced. And obviously that's, that's also is something we have to work with and that is not benefiting the reliability of, of, of energy disclosure. Thanks. We have one more question for you, Elizabeth, from Donald Kriken. Um, you speak of granularity and maturity for a next phase, but there are too many different labels and geo instruments interacting, and that could lead to unnecessary arbitrage. Um, so what can be done to make sure there aren't too many labels that are not working together? So basically within, within AIB, we have label information on the geo. 
However, currently that's only a few labels. So basically we have within our standard uh, an, an uh, accreditation procedure for labels. Basically, in order for a label to be put on a GO, uh, three issuing bodies have to jointly apply for that. So that's what we do in terms of adding labels on GOs. There is indeed a multitude on, of labels uh, all over the market, but th th that's not really uh, related to this actual instrument of the GEO. And I think if um, there would be more coordination in that respect as well, that labels would, would think about what exactly it is they want to certify, that that could already help uh, tremendously. And one last question from me, as promised. So I, I was wondering how this label could apply to determining life cycle emissions of electric vehicles, because this has been a big debate over whether you can really call EVs zero emission when you don't know where the electricity you're using to power them was generated. Um, is there any talk or, or, or thoughts about how this can be used to determine life cycle emissions of electric vehicles or reassure consumers that their vehicles are actually zero emission? Basically, that's not really in, in our remit. Our remit is electricity consumption by consumers. So it's not really about the life cycle of a certain vehicle. Uh, there are systems uh, be, being elaborated in that respect, but it's, it's not something that I'm, I'm uh, I'm able to talk about, I, I don't know much about that, I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries. Okay, thank you very much to Jana and Elizabeth. Let's move on to our third panel, which is on information and skills for green consumption. So for that, we have Marco Salento, Head of Institutional Policy at the European Trade Union Confederation. As I mentioned at the beginning, he stepped in to replace Lodovic Voe. And we have Jad Moad, Head of Communications and Digital at the International Energy Agency, IEA, based in Paris. Um, Marco, let me start with a question for you. So what is the role of trade unions as we're looking at these various issues um, and, and how this is going to affect workers? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much for inviting uh, the ETUC, and me personally, a uh, very interesting topic because actually uh, is not a matter where we are an expert about, but we have found ourselves to stay into this uh, arena uh, because of the effects of the recent crisis and uh, demand that we received from many workers because they were really taken into a trap of the uh, low wages, risk of jobs, and uh, the increase of the bill, the electricity bill, and they were not able to to pay, and uh, it, it, it was really a dramatic moment. Uh, of course, uh, um, there are groups in the human that are specialized. I mean, in the if if you imagine it's, uh, receiving information, treating information putting people together, transforming this strength into negotiation power, negotiating power, this is what we do normally on the, on the workplace. And since some decades, we also try to transfer this capacity, this knowledge uh, in consumers associations that are promoted by the trade union movement. And, in the, and this was very helpful at this stage because we have been able also through several collective agreements to try to uh, protect, to give shelter also with the support of public subsidies or also with the support of the employers to, you know, to create buffers for workers to go through a very difficult moment, inflation, crisis, uh, low wages, etc. But we also have uh, the necessity to change the, um, or oh, the responsibility to try to uh, change the policy frameworks, the legal frameworks. I see that many things that you are discussing about can fit very well uh, with the idea of uh, sustainable investments. So, you know, there is now an attempt of the European Union to try to clarify uh, also in the, in the financial market all these labels that want to um, qualify as green or sustainable a lot of the activities that the companies do, and this sector is, is really uh, concerns and not always uh, at the level of sustainab the, the, the sustainability concept that companies uh, involved in the electricity markets, uh, um, the sustainability approach they have is not really a sustainable one. We're talking about greenwashing, uh, is, not, it is one part of the problem, surely, 
there is also the fact that you know the sustainability should always be multidimensional. So once you try to decide how many renewable energies you can put on the market, how many other uh, alternatives you have for traditional uh, uh, energy production and uh, distribution, you also have um, and you give the benefits for the environment, or you increase the uh, independency from Russia, etc. You increase your uh, strategic autonomy. You must understand that. Uh, all this movement of investment strategies and activities have impact in the social side. P workers, but also community and consumers, these are the three dimensions of social that we try uh, to put together to create a coalition that can help us to uh, introduce some elements that can help uh, uh, workers to go through. Uh, for instance, we have uh, uh, a huge point today, we are trying to mobilize our workers to introduce the idea that we should not, um, I mean, that disconnecting people from the grids or the networks to have access to energy is depriving them of a fundamental right. So this should, we should find a way uh, to solve it when you use subsidies uh, to um, also, I mean, for households to install solar panels or to reduce their energy consumption or companies to do that, we should also be aware the risk is to trigger young spec huge speculations uh, where you inflate a lot of profits of companies producing uh, the products that are subsidized, subsidized but you create also um, problems to those that are affected by transition. Education and training skills are fundamental, investing educating people to go through the transition for us is a really key point and I think that also exploring, continuing exploring the coalition between workers and consumers is important because consuming production and consumption are really <coughs> twins. So probably if we want to change the way we produce, we have to change the way we consume, consume etc. In this regard, it's very important that so starting from the workplace, to how we treat households, there should be a single strategy in order to uh, to achieve a change. Many of things you are telling about that I cannot tell as good as you are doing, but at the same time, um, to bring people with you for a true change. Because if you don't take people uh, with you, it's it's we have we have seen uh, concretely that it's very difficult. I will stay like this for the, for the moment in case we have other questions. I can. Thanks a lot. So, Chad, let's turn to you next. So, the IEA has been increasingly looking at this subject. How would you say we can make sure that there's the right level of public engagement to get consumers aware of what they can do and also play a role in the green energy transition? Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. I'm also very delighted that we're sharing the stage with unions, with consumer groups. I think there needs to be a coalition on this. And I know the topic this morning was more about the energy crisis, but we're going through multiple crises, the energy crisis, the climate crisis. So I'm going to conflate some of them together here, but I think the, the, the learnings uh, apply to both. Obviously, the International Energy Agency, we're a policy body. We're not a regulator. We don't have any regulatory powers. Uh, we try to convince uh, people uh, and governments to do the right things and, and push governments and um, various um, other institutional bodies. But... I think we also have to recognize that we need public support for any policy that we advocate, both for the energy crisis, as we've seen last year, and certainly for the uh, climate crisis. So perhaps the first slides. Um, just wanted to start, sorry, this is very tiny. Uh, this is from the uh, Davos uh, World Economic Forum. They do this uh, global risk survey. On the left, they ask what are the main risks you see for the, first, the next two years, and on the right-hand side, the 10-year risk. Uh, it is also true for other polls that ask people's perceptions about risk in the short term. Obviously, in the short term, you always see the latest headline as the main risk. Two years ago was COVID. Last year was the war. Uh, this year is pocketbook issues. But consistently, when you look 10 years out, five out of the top 10 risks are environmental risk with uh, inability to address climate change or a failure to mitigate climate change as number one. Uh, next slide, uh, please. Um, here, another poll, um, which essentially kind of validates the session, which is uh, from Ipsos here, uh, people asking, when asked what would help you make informed decision, access to information is lacking. I think what we've been saying here is really enlightening. There's a lot going on. And this transition, both in how we respond to the energy crisis, but also how we respond to the long-term uh, climate crisis, 
uh, there's just a lot that is required to do, and um, my head is spinning just from hearing my previous speaker, so uh, I can't imagine what you know the public might feel about this, um, and it's recognized there. So next slide, please. Um, another interesting here finding, um, before we get to the IEA kind of case study, uh, and this poll is asking people for the top three, they were giving a range of uh, questions or topics, that what are the top three things you do that you think has an impact on climate change, uh, on mitigating climate change. And here's what's interesting is that the first one is purchasing renewable electricity. That's great. That uh, in, in terms of ranking of truly reducing emission, that's number four. So that's a good perception. The next two, recycling and less packaging, really have no impact on climate change. And so people's perception of what they do <laughs> to address the topic is really completely off the charts and off the mark of their real perception. And this is not blaming anyone. I mean, I recycle. It's a virtuous thing. There's a lot of public information about recycling. But are, what are we told about addressing climate change or indeed uh, uh, addressing the climate, uh, the energy crisis this year and last year uh, is less easy to do. Uh, next slide. Um, here, um, the question was, I have to read it on my screen, apologies. Uh, in your opinion, uh, which of the following areas will the energy transition have a green positive, uh, orange negative impact. Uh, the transition here has, is seen as having a negative impact on the energy bill and on purchasing power. I mean, we want this to be uh, on the other side um, of, of, the, uh, of the scale. Just again, in terms of public information, complicated messaging here. Uh, next one, please. And a couple of final polls here, uh, just uh, to my colleague on the left. Uh, Real uncertainty also about the impact of the transition on jobs. Uh, equally, people think it will create and destroy jobs at the same time. Uh, that's probably true, but I think that needs to be addressed. Um, and then next one. Um, again, more information. Sorry, you can skip through that one. Um, so before we get to this, sorry for the colors, um, something was said about in the previous panels about empowering citizens. I think there's an issue of trust here that also needs to be recognized. Um, in various polls, you can see that trust in public institutions across the board, so politicians, media, business, elected officials, um, is falling and is very low. So who is entrusted to say the, you know, to pass the message? Uh, that's also something we need to be very conscious of, uh, about. The one category public of, of public officials that is trusted by the public is scientists. But even with the COVID crisis, we saw that trust in scientists has fallen. But um, what is the voice today that is being heard by the public? Uh, again, something we should be uh, focusing on. Um, and, and just a, an aside on media, um, I was, I'm a former journalist. Uh, trust in media is eroding. As, sorry to say that, Dave, uh, as you know. Um, and 20 to 30 year old today, trust social media as much as traditional media. So I don't know if you've been on social channels re recently or on Twitter. I don't know what you can trust that's on these platforms. But today, the next generation, or I mean, we're all on social, I guess. Um, but for the 30 to 20 to 30 year olds, trust social, what they see on social more than they, or as much as they see uh, and trust in the regular media and the traditional media. Uh, so um, I want to talk about what's on the right-hand side of the slide here. So uh, at the IEA, we have, like any public organization, our own channels that we pr publish information. Generally, it's report findings and analysis. But um, to reach a wider engagement with the public, we started working with uh, digital platforms to really take our messages uh, to the public, uh, not waiting for people to sign up to our own Twitter accounts, for instance. So next slide. Um, so, of course, our engagement strategy is in the press. We were very active in the press, but if, if I believe what I just said about trust in, uh, in media, we also need to be elsewhere. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in response to the, um, to the crisis last year, we started doing some public messaging that was more consumer-related uh, rather than, uh, than uh, into the direction of, of governments and policymakers. This is a a project playing my part, which we collaborated with the uh, European Commission uh, uh, colleagues here. Um, this was maybe one of the first times where we put very cut customer directly uh, messages out, which we quantified really to help people understand what they could do to reduce their energy bills. This was titled, if I remember correctly, 
uh, playing my part to save money, reduce reliance on Russian energy, support Ukraine, and help the planet. So this was a, a bit of a, of, a, of a grab bag. But of course, all of these policies do all of these things at the same time. Um, um, and, and that was the first way for us at the IEA to communicate to the public. But um, I want to show you a few more examples here before I stop about things that we are done to basically reach a much wider public. Uh, someone mentioned gaming earlier. Uh, last year, we worked with the Financial Times to produce a game uh, about how to reach net zero. Um, I challenge you all to, to play the game. It's free. I failed um, because it's really hard. Uh, but it's doable, which is kind of the message of our net zero report uh, to how to get to net zero by 2050. Um, this was the first attempt to basically find a different audience than the people who typically look at the IEA and to share our findings in a slightly simpler, but we certainly did not degrade the analysis, but to take the messages to a, to a, a different public. Um, next, please. Last year with the crisis, we also started talking with digital platforms who essentially all of them told us the same thing, which is when there is a crisis, it's true with COVID, it was, uh, it's certainly true with the energy crisis, they're finding it hard to get credible information. Uh, they're finding it hard to service their customers uh, with credible information. Their algorithms are, uh, have trouble surfacing information uh, because there's a crisis. It's hard to see where the you know, truth is. Uh, and also, there's a lot of disinformation and, and outright misinformation out there. So um, what can we do to step in and, and help these platforms where, by the way, billions of people connect every day and not to our website, sadly. So that's where we need to be. Uh, next one, please. So with Wikipedia, we basically worked with Wikipedia to um, update articles that are relevant to the IEA that, on which we had you know, recent findings. Um, and became a, a trusted partner of Wikipedia. Wikipedia is the fourth largest website in the world, or seventh largest website in the world. It's visited billions of times a day. Uh, it's the first source of information for many people. <laughs> so we need to be there. Um, next one, please. Um, same with charts. Next, please. So uh, next one. Uh, Google, if you recall when uh, the uh, pandemic happened a couple of years ago and you were Googling COVID, uh, if you remember, you, and they still have this, um, they have all kinds of modules and widgets at the top of the search page with helpful information. These are basically partnerships that they have done with the World Health Organization, in this case the French government, various credible sources to basically take information and put it at the top of search. And their contention was they need to help customers, the public, find information um, because in a case like this, when there's a crisis again, it's really hard to find through search alone. Next, next slide. They do this in climate change as well, and they have some uh, uh, facts on climate change, if you Google that. Uh, but they identified a content gap with the energy crisis, and so we worked with them. Uh, next one. Based on the uh, Playing My Part report that we did, and based on a number of um, reports that we did to create essentially more public explainers. Again, we are, you, some of us obviously know us, we're, we're a very sort of expert organization. Our reports are not written necessarily for the public uh, yet, um, but we've produced a lot more di easy to digest information online on our website. Next slide. Uh, again, that's the same stuff. Next slide. Uh, we translated that in a number of languages, which is not something we typically do. And then Google basically just took that information and put that at top of search. And so when uh, you Google that, you could find very directly some of the recommendations that are based on the Playing My Part series in this case. Um, as an aside, and same on, same on uh, mobile uh, phones, and the, one of the widgets there, uh, just before that, please. Um, no, back, backwards. Uh, yeah, one of the widgets was, was Wikipedia. And again, it's explained why we need to also be on Wikipedia. Uh, the, my aside on this one is that the crisis is not over. I know we're, we kind of feels like the crisis is over. It's not. But Google discontinued that project because no one was typing global energy crisis anymore or energy crisis anymore. So there's a very clear sense that there's a uh, drop in attention. But our contention is it's not over. And winter again is coming. It happens every year. Um, <laughs> So next one, please. Um, the next project was, is something we're also working with them on heat pumps uh, and on EVs. It's not live yet. Uh, this will be a permanent uh, feature. And here, uh, you know, we want to help provide 
information, again, trying to buy a heat pump is complicated. It differs by country. There are all kinds of technologies. There are all kinds of potential savings. So how can we provide more public information and support uh, platforms like Google, but others? Uh, we're open to working with anyone. Uh, in providing credible information to the public would be a very uh, a good step for us. And then final one, I uh, just want to warn this is not an actual campaign, but also last year we were started to th starting to think about what we could do to be more public and basically have a public information in the street. That's very complicated for an institution like ourselves. We would have maybe tried to do something, but that didn't work out. We didn't try. This was just an ad agency that pitched us. But maybe that's the next step to really kind of take the messages and, and ask for these very famous people to give us the right to their image would have been interesting. Anyway, so uh, I will stop with that. Thank you. Thanks, Chad. That's quite interesting that uh, people have stopped searching for the energy crisis, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's over. Uh, that, that's quite interesting to know. Um, we do have to move straight on to Spain for our closing keynote, but I think both of you guys will still be here if you want to find them after the, the panel, if you have any follow-up uh, questions to their presentation. But right now we're going to go to look ahead to the Spanish presidency of the Council of the EU, which starts in just two months now. Um, we're going to hear a bit about the consumer and retail priorities of the Spanish Council Presidency from Manuel Garcia Hernandez, Director General for Mines and Energy Policy at the Ministry uh, in the Spanish Government, uh, who will speak on looking ahead to these priorities. Uh, turn it over to Manuel. May wait till the first of July. <laughs> <laughs> They're very busy over there. Here we are. Yes. Okay, all, we've got you. you Welcome, yeah, Manuel. I hope you can all see me and hear me correctly. Sorry, uh, the mute button didn't respond. Uh, anyway, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I want to thank the, the Council of European Energy Regulators for inviting Spain to participate in this closing. Customer conference. Uh, personal honor to be given opportunities of the Spanish President of the Council in the areas of consumers and markets, and especially after after these so interesting panels and keynotes that that we have all enjoyed this afternoon. I had the chance to to listen to most of it, and it, they all have been really interesting. As you know, this 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 presidency comes in a in a very special moment. We all think every, uh, all the moments are special, but I think that we can all fully agree that this is a very unique moment. The European Union and, and the and the world as a whole uh, are facing a, a multiple and simultaneous crisis, uh, which have overlapping and amplifying effects. Uh, the energy transition, which is fostered by by this wider process of fully decarbonizing our economies in 2050 is changing the way we produce, we distribute, and we consume energy. And this is by itself uh, uh, an enough important uh, crisis, but uh, and unlike other energy-related industrial revolutions, and this is an industrial revolution that have uh, occurred in history uh, that took many years, even some of them took centuries to fully deploy, this revolution has to be completed in, in a few decades. Uh, since we are running out of time and we have to act now if we want to avoid the most severe effects of climate change. So on top of this huge structural change, which is the, the energy transition and the decarbonization of, of our economies, we have had to deal with two back-to-back -back and, and unexpected crises, uh, the, the COVID pandemic one and the invasion of, of Ukraine, uh, which have added a uh, complexity, uh, have exacerbated some phenomena and also have accelerated the pace of, of this change. We have suffered shocks in, in supply and demand of raw materials uh, in the last two or three years uh, of an unprecedented uh, dimension, and they have shown us how systemic and important energy is for us, for our economies, and how dependent we all are on the energy supply. After many decades of reliable and relatively cheap energy that we have enjoyed, uh, we have recently learned, uh, painfully, uh, unfortunately, in many occasions, that we, not, we cannot give the security of supply for granted. We have learned that we should pay more attention to the dimension of security of supply of energy, 
which is as important as sustainability and competitiveness and, and the other typical dimensions of, of the energy trilemma. And also that having affordable energy, uh, economically speaking, is as important as having available energy, physically speaking. And we have also learned that our consumers, no matter their size, will require additional instruments to protect themselves against this increasing volatility. Because volatility and uncertainty are, are the two key words, in, in our opinion, that all of us, consumers, companies, and regulators, are going to have to get accustomed to in the coming years. However, uh, I think we have good reasons to be optimistic, uh, reasonably or relatively optimistic, uh, always never falling in self-complacency. Uh, I think the EU energy system has proven to be more resilient than many would have expected. Europe has reacted uh, in an effective uh, way to the blackmailing strategy put in place by Putin's regime, uh, using natural gas as our weapon. And thanks to the efforts made by all member states, their citizens and industry, together with the help of two consecutive mild winters, we have been able to substitute all the gas coming in by pipeline from Russia, avoiding the collapse of our economies. We have been able to find alternative sources of supply, we have applied bold efficiency measures, we have switched fuels, and only marginally, fortunately, we have had to reduce consumption by cutting economic activity or well-being. We have also designed and launched innovative solutions based on the cooperation and aggregation across Europe, like the EU platform for gas purchases, which is being launched these days. We are now exiting the, the so-called heating season, 2023, uh, in other words, the winter, in terms of energy consumption, consumption for heating. Uh, and we have more gas than ever in our underground storages and send a clear message to the world, and especially to Putin, that the EU can react promptly and united uh, under the most difficult circumstances. So the, the recent crisis has also taught us that, that the energy transition is the way forward. There is no doubt about this. We have to speed up the development of renewable energies because it, this is the most eff effective way to reduce external dependencies from non-reliable partners and increase our strategic autonomy. However, not everything is, is, is so positive. One important lesson learned is that the regulatory design of our energy markets needs also to be revised and adapted because this increased volatility, which is typical of any transition, together with the need to attract new investments in clean energies, make the current design of the market, in our opinion, neither stress-proof nor future-proof. The electricity, we all know this, is going to play a key role in, in the decarbonization of the economy, because we know renewable electricity is the most efficient way of carving car CO2 emissions. And this is why Spain, initially has been pushing for a reform of the electricity market design since the very beginning of the crisis, probably because of our particular and special circumstances, we were the first suffering from, from the impacts of these uh, shocks in the markets. Uh, and the reason for this structural reform is twofold. We need to attract all these huge investments in renewables, storage and flexibility that we need to meet uh, the net zero targets and also to, to make it possible for consumers to benefit from this carbon-free, cheap, and domestic electricity. But more importantly, we have to provide consumers with shielding instruments against volatility, linking the prices they pay to the, to the long-term average production cost, more which are more stable, competitive, and predictable. There are other important, important dossiers uh, for the Spanish presidency in the area of energy. Uh, first of all, the gas package, as a reform of the directive uh, and regulation of the natural gas internal market that will enable the development of an European uh, hydrogen market. This is a very important topic. Hydrogen is going to be the piece of the puzzle which will make it possible for industry uh, to decarbonize. And secondly, the Critical Raw Materials Act as a part of, of the wider Green Deal industrial plan. This piece of legislation, this proposal, together with the Net Zero Industrial Act, are the response from Europe to the industrial and competitiveness challenges that we are all facing with the goal of taking advantage of industrial and economic opportunities of the digital and green transitions, avoiding the risk of changing some external dependencies for, for others. We are very happy to see that we already have on the table a concrete proposal of reform of the electricity internal market, something that only some months ago seemed very unlikely for, for many people. It is also good to see that there is a common diagnosis of the situation. 
we we have to develop forward markets and contracts, rely less on their head pricing and continue to empower consumers so they can choose between different contracting models and participate in the markets in a more active way, taking advantage of the technological innovations. The reform of the electricity market uh, is probably the most important dossier for the Spanish semester. We are committed to close it before the end of the year, so it can be approved during this mandate of the European Parliament and Commission. We know that the window of opportunity uh, for this legislation is quite narrow with the European elections in mid-2024, but the effort is worth it. Uh, we cannot uh, waste time for this. This is a too important uh, uh, reform. And for that reason, we are already working uh, very intensely together with our Swedish colleagues in the current presidency, the commission, the parliament, aiming to push the file forward ahead of our presidency. For final consumers, especially those uh, smaller uh, households and small and medium businesses, this reform, the electricity market the, uh, reform, this file could appear to be a very theoretical or, or, or distant discussion about the economics, the rules and regulations of the wholesale markets and the markets in general with little direct impact on consumers. Uh, nonetheless, it is quite the opposite in, in our opinion. Uh, we believe that an effective and efficient wholesale power market is the necessary condition for a well functioning of the retail market. At the end of the day, they, they both power market, wholesale market, retail markets are the si are sides of the same coin. And this is why this discussion is so important for all of us. We want this reform to bring fair and competitive prices for consumers and allowing them to be more active in, in the markets. And this reform, for this reason, is not only about uh, wholesale markets, uh, marginal pricing, uh, PPAs, CFDs, or virtual hubs, or other uh, quite complex words. When it comes to consumers' protection, the proposal already includes new specific regulations on supply of last resort, for example, obligations to suppliers in order to, to protect consumers in case of bankruptcy or shocks in, in, in the markets. Also, increased protection from disconnection uh, in, in cases of, of um, tense situations in the market or even price regulations in the event of a crisis. It is also uh, an important reform because it, for consumers because it, because it deepens the empowerment of consumers. Uh, there's been uh, quite an interesting debate about this. Removing barriers for energy sharing, self-consumption, communities, and multiple supply, or improving contractual information and transparency. All these questions are being now discussed by the Energy Council and will be debated with the Parliament and the Commission once the Council reaches a general approach agreement. Hopefully, this will happen in the coming weeks, uh, still during the, the Swedish presidency. And I think that events like this conference today uh, are a unique opportunity for consumers to defend and to voice their interests and positions to participate in the public debate. So I congratulate CAR for its timely organization, uh, for the choice of, of, of the topic, and once again, for inviting me, for inviting Spain to give this closing statement. Thank you very much. And, and of, obviously, I invite you all to come to Spain in the second semester of the year to work in, in this so uh, interesting file. Thank you very much. Thanks, Manuel. A round of applause for Manuel. I think uh, everyone is very excited to come to Spain for the presidency events <laughs> in the second half of the year. Uh, but for sure, it is going to be a busy time for the Energy Council. Starting on July 1st, Spain has some really big ambitions for the presidency, and so we will see where we are by the end of the year. So thank you very much for walking us through that. Now, to close out the day, we're going to hear from Charles Esser, Secretary General of CER, uh, to give us some key takeaways from what we've heard today. Thank you very much, Dave, and uh, I'd like to, first of all, thank all the panelists. I mean, we, uh, today, I really, I, I can't imagine we could have picked better, better panelists, uh, better speakers. Um, we really, we, we got to hear from, from Parliament, from the Commission, and, and from the Council, so I think we were very complete in that. A really wide range of excellent presentations from our panelists, um, we just really exactly what we were looking for, so many thanks to them. Um, and um, today, I, I don't think I can... In, in just a few minutes, uh, cover everything, of course, that was, was said, but I would like to highlight a few things. Um, I think that uh, if we look at uh, the, what started out with our, our president, uh, Annika Grobel, and that we moved on to um, 
uh, MEP Gonzalez, um, we, we looked at the, the, the link between the need to have an energy sector that, uh, that functions well for consumers, but where there actually can be a part of it. Now, the details of how that might work, there might be some disagreements or, or, or of how that actually should be put into place, but I think we, we saw real, disagree real agreement as well as with, with, with um, the, the representative of the Spanish presidency um, coming up uh, that we need an energy sector that where, where consumers are actually contributing to the transition. And so uh, I think that was a real uh, key takeaway of, of all of our, 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 our uh, speakers from the institutions and from, from SEER itself. Um, looking at some of our, our, our panelists, um, I think it was really good to get the key perspective of, of consumer representatives um, and the ideas that they had in particular about contracts, about uh, where, what suppliers should do and, and how they can, they can benefit consumers, um, how how um, consumer organizations can contribute to um, thinking about things that consumers can do to actually reduce their own consumption, how they can benefit. Um, we also heard about uh, the importance of how to take care of vulnerable consumers and, and whether um, we as, as sort of privileged consumers should have a, a bit of a different role in the, in the energy system. And certainly when we think about subsidies and uh, the targeting of them, um, making those targets uh, effective. Um, there's also, uh, I think, um, was brought up uh, by um, uh, the, the by Marine brought up as well that we do need to think a bit about the world outside of Europe and what this what it means, and so we're not isolated just here in Europe and thinking about um, the issues of energy poverty. Do we understand energy poverty in Europe well? Um, are we uh, how are our developments goals, and certainly DG Enter has a part that figures, thinks about external energy policy, something that we're thinking about as well in SEER, is what kind of policy do we have for, for as regulators in terms of our own international strategy outside of Europe, and so it's important to, to think about that carefully and think about that in a way that it, it is, is not sort of um, us dictating with listening, and I think listening was a big important part of what, of what we heard today. Um, we, when it comes to the, the, the second part of the, the day, when we heard, we saw from, from Jad's presentation that we consumers, we, we may not understand exactly what, what people are thinking or that people may have perceptions that are incorrect. Um, and how do we engage with them if they think that recycling is, is, is the most important uh, or one of the most important ways to, to, to contribute to climate change and uh, underestimate, say, the, the importance of, as, as Monique said, of, of, of eating less meat. So um, in how to engage properly, it's something that we question ourselves at SEER. Uh, I think as regulators, how do we engage with the public? I think it's, something, it's a key takeaway would be to, to rethink about how we're engaging with the public, or, or if we're engaging enough, and if we are engaging enough, um, is that engagement in fact effective? Um, uh, I, I, I think it's also important to, to have concrete examples. Um, Justin Pagan gave a concrete example of, of an energy community functioning. Um, that's something to, to look at and see, okay, that actually, that actually works. Um, is that replicable on a larger scale? And if it's not replicable, um, why might that not be? Um, it could be because, as we heard today, there are places in Europe that we still don't have smart meters. I certainly don't have a smart meter. I have the same kind of meter that I remember seeing as a child. Um, and so, um, and I'm not so young. So, uh, you know, it, I, w I would think that if we think, is it really conceivable that in, in 20 years, um, where there still be a significant numbers of member states without smart meter rollout, is that really something uh, conceivable? No. Then if not, if not now, when? That's something to ask about smart meter rollout. Um, I think that was another um, key takeaway. Um, Finally, a key takeaway has been that the crisis has accelerated uh, the transition, accelerated the, the, the pressure for the transition, and accelerated um, the, the, the changes um, that uh, uh, have been demanded by consumers. And so consumers are, are as, as this is a customer conference, customers are demanding new things. Uh, the crisis that we've had in the past few years have made them more aware, and so as they're more aware, 
uh, we ourselves need to respond to that awareness. So with that, uh, I'd like to again thank all of our, our, our panelists. I'd like to note that we have our annual report, so you can see a bit of what we did last year. That's just has been released today. It's there on the stand, so that's, that's something that we released today. We'll, as uh, Jana mentioned, soon have a report on guidelines of good practice for uh, green offers and green washing, which I think will be of interest particularly to this audience. So I do look forward to that being published soon. And uh, with that, I'd like to, to thank uh, everyone and uh, wish everyone a, a, a successful uh, year ahead. Thanks, Charles. So a lot to think over and a lot of exciting things coming up in this policy area for sure. Uh, so thank you so much for attending this event with us today, paying attention so attentively, and I wish you all a wonderful evening. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.